We're at an inflection point in the Fed's policy path and in the Fed's communications. We're starting to see sort of a different kind of Fed narrative evolve this year. There's been some rising angst, but still I think the cuts are on the table. There is a little bit of froth, and maybe it's deserved, as you see Powell kind of shift his narrative to things that allow him to cut. The important thing is that the Fed and markets are in sync after being out of sync. If you look at the market expectations of where interest rates are going to go, the Fed is actually feeling a lot more optimistic about the scope for rate cuts over the next few years. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Ferro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. Live from New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Bramo back in the hot seat alongside Anne-Marie Hordern. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P 500, negative here by 0.2%. Kicking off Q2, hitting a bit of a bump in the road, and it comes from manufacturing. Manufacturing data entering expansion on the ISM for the first time since September 2022. Prices paid a little firmer, Lisa, and this bond market starting off right across the curve. The price is paid was the key point here. The idea that they came in at the hottest level, I believe, going back to the summer of 2022 at a time where people are wondering, is this just a commodities-led blip that is just temporary or, shall we say, transitory? Or is this something deeper that has to do with the ends uh, of goods disinflation? Well, let's get to the one board that matters right now. It is the Commodities Board, WTI, through $85 a barrel. Brent crude getting closer and closer to $90, $89 and about three cents. We're talking about the highest level since October. Throwing gold all-time highs on gold again this morning. AMH, just what is happening on that board right now? Well, when you look at the commodity space, obviously you're going to see a risk premium because what happened yesterday, which was an Israeli strike on um, a key individual in the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, as well as uh, the Iranian embassy in Damascus, Jonathan just dispels more potential upside for the oil market because of the risk that we could see. Iran is now pledging revenge. And at the same time, on the supply side, OPEC is not willing at the moment to add more supply to a market that clearly needs it. To me, I'm just looking at this, and we've been dismissing this for a while. It's been sort of a creeping climb, and now there's some sort of reasons that people are giving to it. At what point does this become a problem? Where suddenly, yes, it's oil prices, but it's also chocolate. It's not just also some of the other commodities ahead of Easter and after Easter, but it's sure. also copper. It's all of, the, all of the different commodity sectors. So can we just say it's an isolated thing having to do with an idiosyncratic risk or is it something else? We've asked this question a few times over the last few years. Do you think this is a reflection of the extension of the cycle or a recipe to end it? Because it's not just better manufacturing data out of the United States, it's out of China as well. Just a bit of an inflection there in the last few days. I was sorry that I missed Jay Pulaski yesterday. Came Jay was really great. Punching, right? And basically his whole comment when he was talking to you guys being like, wake up people, it's commodities, it's supply and demand. There are so many people basically coming to this view. Max Kettner over at HSBC saying that his one conviction is be long oil and he's not alone. Is this the real deal? I think that's the question we've got to ask throughout this morning. Is this the real deal? For a long time, for the best part of a couple of years, we've had a big spread between services and manufacturing. And we've been asking on this program how that spread is going to close. Will services come down to manufacturing or manufacturing up to services? I think what we saw yesterday was just that first early sign that maybe manufacturing is starting to come up to services. Lizanne Saunders, a Charles Schwab coming out, and I think framing it beautifully, saying that we've gone from rolling recessions to rolling recoveries. And we've got to work out what that means for the stock market. Especially if it comes with inflation. And that's the reason why the commodity sector matters. And I would take it a step further and say, how much does this support the idea of a broadening out in the market rally, which all of the guests yesterday on the show with you guys were talking about? And how much does this really stymie it, derail it at a time where people are hoping that yields remain lower and that the Fed can cut? We'll get into that conversation in just a moment. Equity futures on the S&P 500. This morning, at least, a little bit negative. We're down by 0.2% on the S&P. In the bond market, yields just bleeding a little bit higher once again, up three basis points. Your 10-year, very close to the highs of the year at 4.33.91. Coming up this hour, Phil Orlando of Federated Hermes on stronger than expected factory data. John Lieber of Eurasia Group as the US and Israel look to ease tensions. And Abigail Watt of UBS looking ahead to payrolls Friday. We begin with our top story. Investors pushing back Fed rate cut bets. Stronger than expected factory data weighing on markets ahead of this week's jobs data. Phil Orlando of Federated writing this. We're not buyers of the SPX whole hog here. However, we still expect the rally in stocks will broaden out from MAX7 centric to include domestic large cap value, small cap growth, and international. Phil, I'm pleased to say it's with us now for more. Phil, let's get straight to it. The data of yesterday, how much weight would you put on that manufacturing read? John, good morning. Thank you again very much for having me back on. Um, I, I think yesterday's data was very significant. 
that the ISM, as you guys pointed out, was back above the, the 50 level, the contraction uh, line of demarcation, if you will, for the first time in 16 months. And as, as Lisa pointed out, the, the, the number that was stunning was the prices paid component. So you've got a situation where the economy is is strengthening, yet inflation is is sticky, perhaps even accelerating. Now, pair that with the LEI data we saw last week. Leading economic indicators went back positive for the first time in 22 months. And you sit down and talk to our bond people, and they look at these inverted yield curves that we've been watching for the last two years, uh, funds to tens, twos to tens, three-month to tens. They're flattening out. Our bond guys think that those may become positively sloped again. So the the, the risk of recession or, or uh, lower risk of, of a modest soft landing is starting to shift to a, a stronger period of economic growth. But the inflation question, I think, is the more important one. Look at, look at last week's PCE print, core, 2.8% for the month of February. Now, what really caught our attention was the changes in the SCP at the Fed's last meeting. They're going to increase their uh, core PC forecast to 2.6% for next year and cap their 2% target in place for calendar 26. So the, the Fed is telling us that inflation is still a problem. It's going to be a problem as the economy comes back. And, and what all of that means is that there's going to be less rate cuts relative to what the market was expecting just a couple of months ago. So, Phil, given everything you've said, every item on that list in the last couple of minutes, is that good or bad for stocks? Let's make it really simple. Good or bad for stocks? So, the S&P 500 up 10% here in the first three months of the year, up 28% since October. In our view, stocks are ahead of themselves, but uh, we expect sort of a, a rolling correction, if you will. The, the MAG-7 in the last 15 months is up 99%. The, the forgotten 493 is up 22 percent. Our view has been that this rally would broaden out, that we would see some profit taking in the MAG-7 and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the domestic large cap value stocks, the small cap growth stocks, the international stocks, which were largely left for dead over the course of the last year or so. They would find some love and we'd start to see some improvement in, in the share prices of those categories. But Phil, how much do higher rates really challenge the idea of broadening out, particularly to small caps, considering that these companies usually are more leveraged and are more vulnerable to higher rates? Fair point. But remember that, that the U.S. economy is doing relatively better than a lot of our uh, uh, trading partners, Japan, Germany, U.K., all in a recession. Uh, the reality is that small cap companies here in the United States do 80 percent of their business right here at home. And, and from an economic standpoint, uh, we're, we're doing better here. In terms of underlying fundamentals, the sectors within the small cap uh, market, biotechnology, for example, is our favorite, is, is really well positioned. Uh, biotech stocks ha have very strong pipelines. Uh, the valuations have probably never been cheaper. Uh, and with interest rates down at the margin, um, uh, it, the prospect of M&A activity is, is enhanced today versus where they were a year or so ago. What so about, we do like small cap here. What about oil? How much is oil the new MAG-7 at this point where people are talking about the fact that suddenly there is the reality check of supply and demand and the fact that this economy isn't rolling over the way so many people thought? Music to our ears, uh, Lisa, that, that we were very lonely at the beginning of the year talking about oil, WTI, in the mid-60s, thinking that we could see 80 to $90 a barrel by the end of the year. We're now sitting in the mid-80s three months into the year. So this has happened a lot quicker than we thought. But the combination of increased geopolitical risk in combination with the fact that we don't have a, a lot of levers here. Uh, in the past, we might have utilized the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to perhaps adjust the price of oil. We took the SPR down 350 million barrels a couple of years ago and didn't replace it. So at this point, we are sort of at the mercy of the vicissitudes of what's going on globally. Uh, crude oil last September was at $95 a barrel. We could see uh, the crude oil market retest that. Gasoline prices at 350 or so a gallon now could be at $4 uh, over the course of the next couple of quarters. So this move in energy for us is real, and energy has been one of our favorite categories on the domestic large cap value side. Well, Phil, with Brent already trading within your range of $89 a barrel, what do you see for year end? 
uh, higher. Um, we think that 100? WTI could could trade up another ten dollars, and and uh, Brent, you know, maintaining that spread could probably approach a hundred dollars a barrel. So when we were talking in early November and you were talking about double digit rallies on the S&P 500, did you ever expect things to go as far as they have in the stock market? Not, not as quickly as as it has that we've got uh, a 6000 target on the S&P fully discounting calendar 2025 20, earnings. Uh, the market seems to be focusing on that number. We Is didn't it? think that we would get up you know, the 52, 5300 level in the first quarter of this year. So the the, the rally, this 28 percent rally we've seen over the last five months has been much faster than we had expected last fall. So much faster. Great to catch up, Phil. Thank you, sir. Phil Orlando there Thanks for having me. at Federated Hermes. I actually missed this. This came from Jim Reed at Deutsche Bank. Up more than 10 percent in Q1. Knew that. Marking the first time in over a decade that it's been Back-to-back -back quarterly gains in double digits. First time in more than a decade, Bramo. Then I had to back-test that and look at the numbers because I wasn't convinced. It's so going back to the pandemic, thinking about how we came out of that. Haven't seen back-to-back -back double digit quarterly gains in more than a decade. It's kind of a shocking statistic. I mean, we kind of get sort of numbed this idea, OK, it was the biggest start to a year going back to 2019. What's new? OK, that was the pandemic era, a lot of disruptions. But to talk about another era. And we saw that with the Japanese stock market, too. Jim Reed pointing out the fact that the Japanese Nikkei is up uh, the most going back to 2009. We're talking about post great financial crisis recovery yeah. types of levels here. Just absolutely phenomenal. This morning, just a little bit softer. We're down about 0.2 percent on the S&P 500. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere. Here is your Bloomberg Brief with your Hira Hackers. Hey, Yahira. Hi, John. Iran vowing revenge against Israel, blaming the country for a deadly airstrike on its embassy in Syria. The strike in Damascus late Monday killed at least seven Iranian personnel, including senior military commanders. Israel has yet to confirm the attack, but the country's forces have struck Iran-linked targets in Syria in the past. If confirmed, this would be the first time that it's directly hit an Iranian diplomatic facility. UBS says it plans to buy back up to $2 billion of its shares, with up to $1 billion of that total expected to take place this year. The Swiss bank confirming the share repurchase plan today after having suspended its previous plan a year ago amid its government-backed takeover of its former rival, Credit Suisse. The bank expects to complete the merger by the end of the second quarter. Former President Donald Trump has posted a $175 million bond to put a massive civil fraud verdict on hold while he appeals it. The move preventing New York State from seizing his assets, at least for now. Plus, it halts the collection of the more than $450 million he owes after a judge ruled he inflated the value of his assets for years to get better loan terms. Trump is still on the hook for the full amount, plus millions in interest if his appeal fails. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. Up next on the program, the U.S. and Israel easing tensions. We've been very clear about our concerns about a military operation into Rafah. There are more than a million uh, Palestinians who are in Rafah right now. And so we want to make sure if there is going to be a military operation, we have to understand how they're going to move forward. That conversation up next, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Jobs Day, and Bloomberg has the report under surveillance. Job numbers have exceeded expectations consistently. The U.S. is just exceptional. Look around the world. This Friday, Jonathan, Lisa, Anne Marie, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. When you see numbers like this, is that no longer a reason to be hawkish at the Federal Reserve? It's a reason to be cautious, maybe not hawkish. The March Jobs Report, Friday, only on Bloomberg. Well, I said we were hitting the ground running for Q2, and we definitely did just yesterday, didn't we? I said manufacturing shaking things up big time in the bond market. Double-digit gains on a 10-year yield. We had another three basis points to that, 434.51. And the equity market down just a little bit again. We're negative by 0.2% on the S&P 500. Under surveillance this morning, the U.S. and Israel easing tensions. 
We've been very clear about our concerns about a military operation into Rafah. There are more than a million uh, Palestinians who are in Rafah right now, and so we want to make sure if there is going to be a military operation. We also know that there are Hamas operators in Rafah as well, but if they're going to move forward with a military operation, we have to have this conversation. Uh, we have to understand how they're going to move forward. Here's the latest this morning. Israeli officials agreeing to take White House concerns into account ahead of its planned invasion of Rafah in southern Gaza after meeting virtually on Monday. In a joint statement, the White House saying both sides, quote, shared the objective to see Hamas defeated in Rafah and plan to hold follow-up discussions as soon as next week. Joining us now to discuss is John Lieber of Eurasia Group. John, if that's easing tensions between Israel and the United States, tensions certainly weren't easing between Israel and Iran. Let's talk about the strike on an Iranian consulate in Syria by Israel. John, can you tell me about the prospect, how great the risk is that this ends up in a regional conflict? Well, Iran's behavior to date has not suggested they're looking to increase, into a, to get into a regional conflict. Uh, the Israelis killed a, another senior commander in Syria in December, and the Iranian response was relatively muted. This is probably the most senior person that's been killed uh, since Soleimani and during the Trump administration. And the easiest vector for Iran to respond with would be by attacking U.S. forces in the region. And just last night, there's been reports of drones uh, uh, going after some U.S. bases. So that's probably the first uh, order of response is how the Iranians can go after this is to escalate tensions again against the U.S. There's been a bit of a pause in these types of strikes since um, uh, earlier in the year. And the other vector for escalation that's really the more worrisome one would be one of Iranian proxies like Hezbollah attacking Israel from the north. So I, th I think that's the major concern to watch. But so far, Iran has not seemed to want to escalate in that manner. And uh, for now, it looks like the U.S. is probably going to be its main target. But given that Mohammad Zahadi is basically the highest ranking individual that's been assassinated since Qasem Soleimani, which you're talking about, which the Israeli press is talking about, is there potential for a more direct confrontation between Iran and Israel, not through proxies? Uh, I mean, that would be a really unprecedented escalation, especially given that the Iranians have so many proxy forces in the region. It's always possible, but that has not been their MO for a while now. Their MO has been to attack through these proxy groups. They've, they're heavily armed, well-trained, ready to go. And it, it seems to be the Iranian preference, uh, even after more senior commanders were, were, were killed in recent years, uh, the Iranians haven't tried stoking direct confrontation because they don't seem to want to. Now, of course, that could change. Everything that's happening in the Middle East right now is unprecedented. But the pattern of behavior has been pretty clear. The Iranians don't seem to want that type of conflict. While this is happening, it does seem like the temperature was taken down between Washington and Jerusalem, this relationship that has been very acrimonious, especially in public, between Netanyahu and Biden. We now have those officials heading to Washington next week. How important is it for these two countries to show a united front at this time when we see this escalation in the region? Uh, it's certainly important for Israel. I mean, for Washington, it's a lot more dangerous, I think, particularly for the Biden administration, given that this remains one of the key political vulnerabilities that they face. And you've seen the Biden administration shift their views on their support for Israel, including by abstaining at the U.N. Security Council vote last week. So for Washington, uh, their relationship with uh, the Israelis, and particularly Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, is a political liability, but it's obviously one that they're willing to take on because of the support for Israel runs so deep in Washington. Now, public opinion in the U.S. is starting to shift with more Americans questioning U.S. support for Israel, given the image that are co images coming out of Gaza. But that hasn't deterred the Biden administration. And I will say that they've been effective so far. I mean, the Rafah operation could have started two or three weeks ago when the Israelis were looking at uh, amassing troops down there, and it hasn't yet. And you've got to think the only reason for that has been the strong U.S. pushback uh, and concerns about stoking another humanitarian crisis. To put these two ideas together, you did mention something that was really important, the idea of a potential escalation on the northern border with Lebanon, with Israel, and some sort of a direct attack from Hezbollah on Israel. How much power does the U.S. have to prevent Israel from actually going on the offensive, which is what a lot of people have suspected is the next step and that this latest strike shows a willingness to do? 
Yeah, I, I mean, the the U.S. has not looked particularly effective uh, in slowing Israel down, other than this Rafah operation. I mean, I would say they had some success in the Rafah operation, but Israel is intent on rooting out Hamas, and they're intent on re-establishing dominance and deterrence in the region. And nothing the U.S. is saying right now is inclined to stop them. In fact, the U.S. Is, continues to ship them more offensive weapons even as they do increase domestic calls for a, a ceasefire uh, in order to arm Israel and allow it to continue this offensive. So I don't get the sense, we don't get the sense right now that Israel is looking to stoke a conflict on the northern border. It seems like the mission is focused in Gaza, but that could be, you know, depending on the perceived threat to Israeli security, that could easily be another front that opens up in this war. Alima Croft of RBC Capital came out with a note that I thought was fascinating. She pointed to this as being the biggest potential escalatory risk. And the reason why she sees this is actually a considerable escalation. When it comes to domestic politics, how much power does this administration have to counter gasoline prices that have been on the rise, that will continue rising, inevitably on the heels of any further escalation? The American administration or Netanyahu? Yes, the American administration. Yeah. I mean, yeah, no, I, well, I think that, uh, so look, rising prices are obviously a huge vulnerability for Biden. Uh, it's one of the reasons that everybody's so worried about bringing the Iranians uh, into this is because the Iranians don't want that oil to get off the uh, market and neither the, to the Americans because they need prices to remain low during a, 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 an election season. But that doesn't seem to have a lot of implications for uh, a, a conflict purely within Israeli territory, including on the northern border. So I think the Americans are desperate to keep the Iranians out of this, to keep this as a regionally contained crisis, but that, but the Israelis have a singular focus on their own security. And that's what's driving them right now. And that's going to be what continues to drive them, no matter what the Americans say. Yeah, one side of that conversation is not worried about the oil market at all. John, thank you, sir. John Lieber there of Eurasia Group. Let's get to the Commodities Board and talk about what's happened with crude. WTI threw $85 for the first time since October. Brent crude getting closer and closer to 89 And what we're seeing in the commodity market, pair that with what we're seeing in the Treasury market, new highs for the year on a US 10-year, Lisa, just months ago, very, very close to 4 35. The idea of a 10-year yield, 30-year yields, spiking yesterday on the heels of some of these concerns, not only about the ISM prices paid, but also the ongoing pressure with oil prices, and this inability to see how you de-escalate this. When you have one actor in the space that has a singular focus, Iran is trying maybe not to escalate, but there's a real question of how and how this remains contained if the U.S. doesn't have more influence over Israel at this point. Yeah, it might be a stretch to call this a haven trade, given the fact that Treasury sold off yesterday, yields rose, gold rallied too. I find the inflation component of this story to be quite interesting. It started going into the Federal Reserve meeting. We had gold hitting all-time highs. And I just wonder if we keep going back to the same line from Chairman Powell, the same question we had coming out of the news conference. Just how committed are they? to that 2% inflation target, because the language around it has changed. We've been talking about this for a while. August 2022, it will require pain. And now the story's changed. And I get it, the inflation numbers have developed too. But the story now is it will require time. The emphasis is on time and not on pain. Which is the reason why you're starting to see these shifts, subtly under the hood, right? It's not a wholesale rejection saying the Fed isn't going to necessarily have its target there. But look at, for example, five-year, five-year forward break-even rates. Just creeping up a little bit. You get this sense, especially with the oil market, people starting to realize, wait a second, something is percolating here under the surface, and it's really reflected in bonds that still are down 11% since the end of 20, uh, 2020. Abigail Ward of UBS joining us a little bit later on this hour to weigh in on the Federal Reserve. And what this inflation story means for the Fed going through this year as traders push back once again the prospect of rate cuts, cutting the probability of a rate cut in June in half, just a 50% chance now. The broader equity market on the S&P 500 Weaker yesterday, weaker again this morning. We're down by 0.2% on the S&P. In the bond market, new highs for the year on a 10-year, 4.35. That new high for the year, the print, just moments ago. Coming up on this program, up next, Bloomberg's Craig Trudell on an EV surprise in China and Tesla deliveries coming out a little bit later this morning. Tesla is down by 1.6%. From New York City, this is Bloomberg.
difference one ISM print makes, hey? Snapping 16 straight months, 16 consecutive months of shrinking activity, just like that. Equities down again this morning, negative by 0.2% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, negative a quarter of 1%. The price action in the bond market right across the curve. Twos out to 30s, we were looking at something like double digit gains on a 10 year yield, all the way out to 30s. We're up again this morning by four basis points. The 10 year, three 34.71 and just moments ago, literally in the last 20 minutes or so, new high for the year, 4.34.91. Yields up, Lisa, four basis points. And it doesn't seem to be really hampering this idea of a broadening out in the equity rally, which I think is interesting. We are not seeing the same kind of fear that we used to, which raises this question, how much are we seeing a point that people have dismissed the idea of stagflation? All of those concerns with higher commodity prices are no longer on the table and it's just Finally, the commodity sector realizing how much strength there is in this global economy led by the United States that's percolating out everywhere else. So we're certainly seeing deflation, right? The stag is the debatable piece of this. Prices paid sort of add to deflation part of the story. The stag's hard to say stagnant when you see a manufacturing recover, when you see the labor market data that we have seen so far. That could change on Friday, but at least so far pretty solid. Which raises the question, Bill Dudley answered this with you guys yesterday, are we really sufficiently restrictive? Does this really give the sense that the rate currently on 10-year yields, on 30-year yields, on two-year yields are hampering the growth rates of the United States? It doesn't seem like that's the case. I think we have to accept the way you look at things is different to the way that Chairman Powell looks at things. Think about how we answered the question on financial conditions. This came up with Bill Dudley yesterday as well. You ask the chairman about financial conditions and he says they're tight. Then we look at what's happening in broader markets, stocks all time highs, credit spreads at multi year tides, the amount of individuals, companies that came to market in Q1 of this year and issued debt getting ahead of maybe a crunch a little bit later this year. That doesn't smell that tight to me just on first look. Which is the reason why, as you pointed out, people are ratcheting back expectations for rate cuts this year and now are back to pricing in fewer than even the Fed sees. Does this matter? I mean, this again, we've gone from this is dependent on rate cuts, too. As long as the Fed begins a rate cutting cycle, even with one rate cut, that's going to be sufficient to send risk assets to the moon. Is it? I mean, I challenge that. I wonder whether you can see a real broadening out if you see the companies that are most vulnerable to higher rates, uh, you know, face off with much higher rates. I just have one question for anyone on the FOMC. Just how lonely is President Bostic right now on the Federal Reserve signaling what? One cut this year. Just how lonely is he? at the Fed, given the data we've seen. Sounds like Neil Kashkari is on board with him. Right. They probably are in the corner by themselves eating lunch kind of bitterly. You know, why doesn't anyone see what we see? And everyone in the market sees it. Why won't they come around to our view? But, you know, do they have to do more than one rate cut? Right. I mean, I guess that that's one question. Is one rate cut the signal of the process or could it just be one rate cut? And Bostic and Kashkari are there in the lunchroom eating their chicken sandwiches. You know, they were at Jackson Hole. Do you remember this? They were eating lunch together and I was trying to listen <laughs> into what they were talking about, but I couldn't this, hear a single. Yeah. This is what they were talking <laughs> about. Right. But that was last year. I've, I've got no idea if they were ahead of the curve that much last year. Let's get to Anne-Marie's board. We need to talk about what's happening in commodities. Got new highs for the year on Brent, on WTI. Brent getting closer and closer to 90, $89 a barrel. Went through 85 on WTI. Copper back through 9K, saw that in March as well. AMH, what's happening in gold? All-time highs once again. It's quite a run on gold at the moment. Quite a run. We've seen this also when uh, a pickup after China reported their manufacturing numbers. We see as central banks come out and buy more gold. Everyone's talking about potentially this is an inflation hedge. But to Lisa's point earlier, it's not just gold. It's not just copper. It's across the entire commodity space. And obviously, oil definitely in focus today. And a lot of people are starting to say, wow, we're already at my year-end target for where I thought oil was. And we're going to have to look at that upside risk. This whole feeling where ISM is, where prices paid is, where oil is reminds me of the summer of 2022. And that's going to be troubling for this White House. Big time. Gold right now up for a sixth straight day, up by another 0.4%. Under Savannah's this morning, hotter than expected factory data weighing on markets, pushing back rate cut bets. The ISM manufacturing gauge showing an expansion for the first time in 16 months. Investors will be looking ahead to Fed speak today from Bauman, Williams, Mester and Daly, plus factory orders and jolts at 10 a.m. Eastern time. How important is jolts data? It's not for me to say. The Federal Reserve chairman answered that question for you. He believes it is important because he's pointed to that as evidence that maybe this labor market story is starting to soften just a bit. Okay, so here's a question for you, because I have to say, I was reading a lot of notes about the ISM manufacturing data that came out yesterday, and so many people were explaining it away as data that was noisy and irrelevant. If we get 
higher than expected job openings, do you start getting people explaining it away as an insignificant number? Because they're looking at the desire of Fed Chair Powell to cut rates. You know, at what point do these data points matter versus be, you know, serving as anecdotes along a bumpy path to what Fed Chair Powell wants to do and is going to do anyway? And not my opinion, just an observation, but I think we're on the same page. The Federal Reserve Chair has basically characterized as anything that goes against the grain the trend as a bump in the road. He's used that word bumpy quite a few times. And everyone's on board with that. I mean, so many people are saying manufacturing, we expected this, this was a blip, we're not gonna get more, oil prices are transitory, this is just simply an issue of things resurging, chocolate prices, you know, eat, have Easter and then move on. But at a certain point, is there something real here? And that I think is something that an increasing number of people, I'm thinking of, for example, Jim Bianco, are really thinking about. It feels like a turn. It feels like a turn. It's early days, but it certainly feels like a turn. Let's get to this story. United Airlines is asking pilots to take unpaid time off next month. The airline's saying staffing cutbacks could extend into late 2024, thanks to delayed deliveries from Boeing. United announcing earlier this year that flight hours would be trimmed. United is set to receive 80 MAX 10s this year, but is now looking to convert those orders to smaller planes if it means, Anne-Marie, it will receive the jets sooner. United is down by about three quarters of one percent. And it's astonishing, really, that they're telling pilots. Remember, there was a crunch after COVID. People started flying again and they were like, we actually need more pilots. Now they're saying, well, we're not going to have the planes, so we don't need the pilots. What does this mean going into the summer? Higher airfares. Fares are coming up. Helene Becker said it a few times on this program. And you get under, well, here's my concern. If you have people, I know your personal concerns. Well, Do you mean like your broader concern about the economy? Well, I have personal concerns about the experience of flying, which is deteriorating rapidly. But I also, I also have concerns about high talent getting shafted. Yet again, to your point, Anne-Marie, I mean, this idea of if you have people who are put to the sidelines yet again, how many people remain in the workforce? And if you have that sort of experience leaving the workforce, do we end up with more Boeing type issues, right? I mean, this is sort yep. of one of the key questions that people have been asking. We've had chaos in that industry through the pandemic and out the other side post pandemic. Let's get to crude. Crude futures hitting $85 a barrel for the first time since October. OPEC production cuts, ongoing conflicts, particularly in the Middle East, continuing to lift prices. Brent nearing $90 a barrel at $88.94 this morning. And US gasoline demand up for six straight weeks. Do you of politics, I think we have to talk about it. Very, very close to a story of, say, $4 a gallon in the summer at the pump for Americans. Now, we know last time around they reached for the strategic midterm reserve and basically unloaded it <laughs> onto markets. And you know what? To some extent, to a great extent, it worked. Do they even have that option this time around? Now it's going to be called the Strategic Presidential Election Reserve, and they do have that option, but they're starting at a different base. So we have seen the U.S. go out. They've been refilling the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, but they brought it to a 40-year low. So the base on which they can draw from, this, that ceiling, it's, it's, much, it's much harder this time around. Also, they've already done it. And they've gotten a ton of pushback about it. So if they do it again, it is going to look very political. What's the blame now? I guess it'll be the crisis in the Middle East. Does it matter? I mean, I guess that that's really a question. We can talk about whether it's political or not. If they say, yeah, it's political, and we want you guys to have lower prices, are people at the voting booths really going to care? I mean, that's essentially where we've been. They can talk about the midterm, uh, you know, the, the strategic mid midterm reserve fund, and we can talk about it with some kind of irony, and they probably would say that it worked. I mean, we basically yeah. sold high and bought low. Let's talk about the strategic presidential reserve. I like that. I like that. We'll be talking about that in a few months, I'm sure. Brent crude right now, just south of 89, WTI, $85 a barrel. Elsewhere, shares of Xiaomi jumping as much as 16% in Hong Kong. Orders for its first electric vehicle topping estimates. The company saying it received nearly 90,000 orders within the first 24 hours. Meanwhile, Tesla facing another setback. Atlas lowering projections for vehicle sales in the first quarter, with waning demand and higher rates taking its toll on purchases. Bloomberg's Craig Trudeau joins us now. From London for more. Craig, we can talk about the competition in China in just a moment. Let's talk about the number that comes out later this morning from Tesla. What are you looking for? I, I think the, the general sense is absolute uh, pessimism. I mean, the, the number of uh, revisions that we saw just in the last week or two, um, I counted at least nine. Uh, and, and interestingly, uh, one analyst uh, at, at Deutsche, Deutsche Bank actually cut uh, twice in the course of just a couple of weeks. So initially they were starting uh, to, they were looking for 476,000 units 
They cut that down to 427,000. Last week, they went down to 414,000. That last number would be actually below where they were a year ago. The last time we saw a Tesla report a year-over-year decline in deliveries was the second quarter of 2020. So that is not a milestone that we see out of this company, uh, you know, very uh, often. And it speaks to the, the, you know, sort of tired nature of, of uh, their lineup. Uh, the Model 3 and Model Y are getting a little bit long in the tooth and they don't have reinforcements on the way to kind of you know get consumers interested. How much of this truly is a Tesla problem and how much of it is just a broader EV issue? I think we're we're absolutely seeing uh you know the the case that uh there may be some some issues with uh you know finding the sort of next uh you know incremental EV buyer. You know, the, the early adopters, uh, to some extent, maybe are, are satiated, and these companies are having a little bit of, of trouble uh, finding, uh, you know, the consumer who's willing to take that, that leap and go uh, electric. I think we've uh, seen this across the board, even, uh, you know, BYD, which has just been on this, you know, incredible run the last couple of years, uh, even they had a, a bit of a setback in the first quarter in terms of you know, where, where they were last year, uh, particularly to end the year. And so we do expect actually, you know, for all of the negativity around Tesla going into this print, we do expect them to out, outsell BYD for the for, first quarter and take back leadership of, of the global BEV market. Greg, it's really interesting when you're talking about this being an EV market problem. It raises even more questions about Xiaomi, which is a smartphone company that came out with a new phone, with a new car uh, that actually did much better than expected. How can we understand that? Is this an idiosyncratic company or does it highlight that the barrier to entry to this business isn't as high as it used to be? I think it's really interesting what we're seeing. You know, there was all this hype and, and speculation about the Apple car for going on, you know, roughly a decade. Uh, we're, not, we're now seeing uh, not just one, but two big uh, smartphone companies uh, you know, get involved in the EV sector in China uh, before Xiaomi, it was uh, it was Huawei. And I think this does speak to the sort of, you know, interest on the part of the Chinese consumer in, you know, in technology. I think we, we, we've seen that for years with Tesla having, you know, real serious competition uh, in Elon Musk speaking very highly of, of uh, the Chinese manufacturers. The fact that we've seen uh, some of these, you know, companies in China that are seen as, as you know, the sort of best of the best in terms of uh, technology in the mobile phone sector, as they enter the car market, they sort of bring with them that goodwill and, and uh, interest on the part of the consumer. Uh, and and we've, we've seen Huawei uh, really, you know, blow the doors off in terms of expectations and Xiaomi, you know, coming in right after and, and you know, sort of replicating that success. So, you know, just based on what we've seen thus far out of these two companies, I think, you know, th they're going to keep pressing the envelope there until they run into in, into any resistance. Can I just borrow a word of yours, Craig, replicating? Can we just compare and contrast what's coming out of Xiaomi to the Model 3 in Tesla? These vehicles, Craig, they look very, very similar. What do you think is actually going on here? I mean, I think they absolutely look similar. I think uh, you even hear the executives talk about how they're sort of, you know, looking uh, to to, uh, you know, take on Tesla in a head-on fashion, uh, comparing themselves with Porsche a little bit, which might be a little bit ambitious just given where they're pricing this vehicle. But they want to be seen as more upscale. You've seen, uh, you know, a lot of the, the competition uh, against Tesla in China come in uh, at lower prices. BYD in particular is, is really aggressive on a, a pricing uh, front. But, you know, while while I do think this, this model will sell for less than a lot of uh, what, what Tesla sells, they are a little bit at a at a discount, uh, but but you know closer to Tesla than what we've seen out of you know some other companies. So they're going uh, both for value and volume, as opposed to you know a lot of this competition. It's it's really sort of been a race to the bottom that we've seen, uh, particularly I would say in the last six months. Craig, appreciate it. Tied to the desk, waiting for those numbers to drop from Tesla. Craig Trudeau down there of Bloomberg, in our office in London. I cannot think, and I said this yesterday, of many sectors where the competition is as fierce as the auto sector in China right now. That's the politically correct way of saying it, right? I mean, basically, the implication here is that potentially and historically, companies go to China and there's a concern about the intellectual property and what happens with that. And it raises this question of, OK, well, if companies are going to go back to China and do business, how much assurance do they have that their intellectual property will be secured? That being said, it's quite the achievement for the smartphone company to develop the car they've developed, particularly the setback that Apple have had, and they ultimately threw in the white towel 
Which is the reason why I ask, what's the barrier to entry? Does this mean that it's a lot lower, or does it mean that there's something different going on with this company? Or are China markets really diverging to, uh, dramatically from the U.S. market because there is a different incentive for the electric vehicle, vehicle adoption than, say, in the United States? Tesla right now negative in the pre-market by about 1.7%. Let's give an update on stories elsewhere. Here is your Bloomberg Brief with Yahara Hakez. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. Disney is ahead in its proxy battle against Nelson Peltz's Tryon Partners with more than half of all the votes cast, according to the Wall Street Journal. The paper says BlackRock and T. Rowe Price are among the major investors backing Disney. The journal says investors are still casting votes and can change them through the annual meeting tomorrow. Peltz is seeking a board seat for himself and former Disney CFO Jay Rasulo. More job cuts at Citi. A fresh round of reductions at its investment bank saw managing directors in the technology, media, and telecom division, plus those covering equity capital markets, leave the Wall Street lender. The latest cuts coming as Citigroup says it's concluded the major actions around its reorganization plan, which aims to streamline operations by eliminating 20,000 roles. McKinsey has made a unique offer to some of its staff. Take nine months pay and go away. The management consulting firm is dangling the pay along with career coaching services to some UK staff who they would like to leave. The move is the latest personnel shakeup at the firm and comes shortly after it warned some US consultants they were running out of time to get a promotion. That's your Bloomberg Brief, John. Yahara, thank you. So it's not just nine months off and you can go back to the job. You've got to like leave, leave. Yeah, it's trying okay. to encourage them. I like the way that they tried to shape this. We're encouraging them to move on to new things, to really challenge themselves. It is kind of a nice way to get fired, though. They're going to trim headcount, likely, if no one takes this. So nine Are you months recommending? Leave and, then, and then head out. I thought this was a new European social program that I could get on board with, <laughs> but apparently not. Sort of nine yes. months off full paint. Yeah, you want that? Oh, totally, don't as you? As long as you have a job at the <laughs> yes. end of it. I, mean, I want a job at the end of it. That's part of it. Yeah, yeah, obviously. Yeah, other you could write a book. Goes. I'm next on this program. Higher for longer. My personal opinion is monetary policy is not really exerting that much restraint on the economy. And that's why the Fed has been on this path of being having to stay higher for longer. That conversation up next. The cross-asset price action is anything but boring right now. Earlier on this morning, in the last hour, new high for the year on a US 10-year, 434.91. Yields up three basis points this morning. In the commodity market, $85 on WTI. New highs for the year there on crude as well. And in the equity market, just inching lower yesterday again this morning. We're down about a quarter of 1%. Under surveillance this morning, higher for longer. Right now, there's a bit of a, a, a battle going on. The long lags of monetary policy versus the easing of financial conditions. My personal opinion is monetary policy is not really exerting that much restraint on the economy. And that's why the Fed has been on this path of being having to stay higher for longer. Here's the latest this morning. Odds of a June rate cut dipping below 50% with plenty of data on deck. The jobs report due at 10 a.m. Eastern time today ahead of Friday's main event, the March payrolls report. Abigail Watt of UBS writing, quote, we expect an employment report that would exceed consensus expectations, yet we do not think that will derail the plan to dial back the restrictiveness of monetary policy at the June FOMC meeting. Abigail Watt, I'm pleased to say, is with us now to discuss. So, Abigail, before we look ahead, we need to look back just to yesterday and talk about that ISM manufacturing read. How much weight would you put on that number, those numbers, out yesterday? Yeah, so the ISM did come in a little bit stronger than we had projected yesterday. Um, but I would say that when we look at the broad swath of manufacturing surveys from regional feds um, alongside that, ISM print, uh, we are seeing that generally those are remaining in contractionary territory and actually a number of them uh, worsened in March as well. So I think when we look across the, the broader kind of spectrum of data that we have for the manufacturing sector, we're still seeing quite a, a weak outturn in the manufacturing sector in the US. This is actually really interesting to me, Abigail, because this is exactly what a lot of people were writing in notes that I read over the past couple of days, that they dismiss certain data points that we're all looking at as just simply aberrations with respect to the other data and don't really highlight something more than a bump in the road. What would give you pause that some of these hotter than expected prints are more than just a bump in the road? 
I think what um, you'd be looking for is a corroboration of that signal, right? What you'd be looking for is the fact that you see a range of data coming in kind of hotter than expected. Um, and also, I think, looking particularly at those data that, that matter the most to, to kind of policymakers. So looking at kind of the labor market data, looking at the data we're going to get later this week, seeing how that plays out, looking at the inflation data, focusing in on those metrics that we think um, are kind of front and center for policymakers as they head into the kind of monetary policy decisions in May and June. One of the data points that we keep watching are the commodity sectors uh, that have been on a tear. And a lot of people are pointing to that and saying, how much more evidence do you need that manufacturing is picking up around the world and that we are seeing that kind of robust activity percolating into copper, into uh, even some of the precious metals, as well as, of course, into oil? Yeah, I mean, if we look at the hard data, though, like if we look at the actual kind of manufacturing output is 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 down year to date this year, we had two quite soft prints in January and February. Um, and when we pair that with the idea that we're not necessarily seeing kind of a big pickup in maybe maybe CapEx intentions and some of these survey based measures, as I said, are still remaining in contraction. Um, I do think when we look across the kind of broad spectrum of data, um, we're not necessarily seeing that kind of res resurgence and, and kind of improvement improvement in the manufacturing sector as yet in kind of some of those harder data too. We put up a quote of yours, Abby, about two minutes ago, and you said this, and I want to repeat it. We do not think the recent data will derail the plan to dial back the restrictiveness of monetary policy. I want to talk about that R word because Bill Dudley said this, his personal opinion, monetary policy is not really exerting that much restraint on the economy. Can you just explain the divide between, say, you and a Bill Dudley at the moment? I think there are pockets of the economy where you've certainly seen the impact of higher rates. Um, for example, if we look at business investment through 2023, um, business investment was was pretty weak through 2023. You saw kind of residential investment clearly hit by those higher rates. And I think as well, like given the kind of headline strength we've seen in the consumer, I think one of the things that can be missed is where you are seeing signs of stress on the consumer side. And one of the things that we put in our in our new outlook that we published two weeks ago was that the, the kind of distribution of wealth across consumers, um, you know, is, is unequal. And one of the things that we are seeing is that at the lower end of the income spectrum, you are seeing signs of stress. You're seeing kind of delinquencies rising on credit cards, on auto loans. And this is kind of also exacerbated by that return of student loan repayments. When we look at those kind of age groups that are more likely to have student loan debt, those are the age groups where you are seeing those delinquencies rising. So there is certainly kind of pockets of the consumer sector that are also feeling those higher rates. Abigail, do you think that this Federal Reserve would be willing to cut rates to ease some of the pressure on those segments, even at the risk of allowing inflation to run higher for a lot longer? I think the Fed have been really clear that they're looking for progress on inflation. Um, and I think the, the thing that they'll be looking for is that continued progress. They have said that they don't necessarily need to see inflation return to 2% before they can begin to dial back the restrictiveness of policy. Um, but it does feel like, given the kind of strength they've seen in the labor market, given the fact that they have seen kind of, we saw upward revisions to growth through Q4 last week, you know, given the fact that they've seen that activity data as a whole remaining resilient, I think that does give them the space to kind of wait and see um, and digest that data before removing policy uh, restrictiveness. Lots more data through this week. Abigail, we've got to go. Abigail, what there of UBS? Abigail, thank you. Looking ahead to that economic data, it starts with job openings later on this morning, 10 a.m. Eastern time. Going through to ADP, then on to jobless claims and on to payrolls on Friday. I'll share the estimate, just a sneak peek at a survey here at Bloomberg. The median estimate right now, 203, 203,000 is the median estimate in our survey. As you know, that can move around. It can move about as we get more estimates going into Friday. The previous read was 275. And Lisa, I remember you said it last month going into payrolls. You were less interested in the current month's economic data and far more interested in the revisions, just to try to work out just how real, just how boomy January truly was. And it wasn't as boomy as people previously thought, but it was pretty boomy based on historical standards. Again, this talks to this idea of there's plenty of strength. Have we priced it all in? Is it still continuing? And how do people explain it away as somehow being underwhelming and not inflationary and whatsoever because it's going to be simply one anecdote and the bump of the road that everybody wants to see? It's hard to describe anything that comes in with a two-handle, two hundred and something thousand as, as weak, as soft, as evidence of restraint of the Federal Reserve. Which is the reason why I really think it's interesting. Abigail was talking about sort of lower income families that have been disproportionately hit. And that is a big concern. You just wonder, is this a more patient Fed that wants to prevent 
certain segments from getting felt, get hit, hit hard on that particular aspect of higher rates, even at the expense of waiting much longer. A socially conscious Federal Reserve, I would say a socially conscious Chairman Powell. I think we saw a few hints of that in the pandemic. Coming up in the next hour on Bloomberg Surveillance, Troy Gayeski of FS Investments, Stephen Cook of CFR, Mark Chandler of Bannockburn and Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Look at the fundamentals. I don't see earnings moving lower anytime soon. The markets have already moved in the U.S. intact. We want to be looking for the new areas of opportunity. Anything that's kind of been deputized into AI has been driving the market. I think people are getting tired with the same story. This broadening is, is a good sign of more confidence in the market. I think this market wants to rotate and it's starting to happen. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Ferro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. We've got a lot to talk about in the second hour of Bloomberg Surveillance this morning. Live from New York City, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. Your equity mark on the S&P 500, a little bit softer yesterday, a little bit softer this morning. The levels elsewhere, though, new highs for the year on a U.S. 10-year in the last hour this morning. That high is 4 34.91. New highs for the year in the commodity market, both on Brent and WTI. New record highs on gold. Lisa Gold on quite a streak. Which is the reason why people are looking to that asset class maybe as a read on inflation and on the haven kind of trade more than bonds right now, given the fact that you haven't really seen as much nervousness expressed there. When you talk about this threshold of bonds continuing to sell off, at what point do people start to worry about both oil prices rising, a deficit heading into an election, yep. and the fact that this is a Federal Reserve that's facing a lot of obstacles to cut rates as quickly as they wanted to. A strong whiff of inflation on that board, that's for sure. Let's talk about it a little bit more. Brent crude very close to 90, in at around 89 this morning. WTI bridging 85, I think, for the first time since October. Hey, Amy, you just keep going through the numbers repeatedly commodities breaking out over the last few weeks yeah and what's so interesting about the oil market is you have three different dynamics at play one supply opec plus cutting back reduction even overnight we're hearing that mexico is ratcheting back supply from their state uh, controlled oil company demand starting to pick up in places like china and then the risk premium you're seeing of what happened yesterday in the middle east and this concern given that Iran has come out and said there will be revenge on this strike at their consulate embassy in Damascus. That just means more upside potentially for crude. Let's pick out one piece of that and talk about demand and what we've seen in the last couple of days. China, manufacturing expanding, the official read for the first time in five months. In the United States, seeing that expansion for the first time in 16 months. It's literally been a year and a half. And Lisa, you start to think about the economy, not maybe plateauing, but perhaps re-accelerating in certain parts, away from services and towards manufacturing. I'm kind of sad I missed Jay Pulaski yesterday. Jay was I, pretty I just, solid. I want to just, this is a quote from him. I have to share it. Everyone wants to talk MAG-7, MAG-7, MAG-6, MAG-5. I'm trying to do it. I'm not doing a very good job. Sorry, Jay. Commodities, people, it's really basic. <laughs> it's supply and demand. So again, this is a reason why we keep asking, is this a symptom or is this a cause? Is this a symptom of the growth that is under the hood that could continue? Or is this going to be the cause of inflation that's going to hamper growth? This has always been the question. Are higher oil prices inflationary or disinflationary? Right now, what everyone said, music to my ears, it's inflationary, not disinflationary. A reflection of the strength or a recipe to end the cycle? We'll see, but that's the debate we'll have this morning. Equity futures on the S&P 500, negative by a quarter of 1% on the S&P. Yields are higher again by close to 4%. Basis points, Lisa, very close to 435 on the US 10 year. Those levels just won't go away. And it's been this grind, and we've seen the grind continue. I went back to 2020 at the end of the year to see how much bonds have lost since then. They have not recovered ground. They are down 11% since then. It's this grind that raises this question, what happens if this Fed doesn't cut this year or could only cut once? Do we start to really kind of reset with the idea of what is restrictive and what a neutral rate looks like for the foreseeable future? Does President Bostic find some company on the FOMC? You mentioned that Kaskari's on... Team Bostic, perhaps. They're having lunch together. Perhaps some others join yeah. too. We cannot officially say they've had lunch together. That I is, that you that just is the most TK thing I've ever heard. <laughs> well, you said yeah, that they, they were having, having lunch. lunch. They had lunch in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, last August. <laughs> well, that's big. I can they confirm. lunch. Please I can write confirm. in. Kashgari, Neil, 
I've got no right idea in, how please. often they lunch. How often do you lunch? They can answer that question for themselves. I think that they should answer it. Coming up this hour, they should both come on this programme. <laughs> Troy Gajewski of FS Investments on why he's calling for a spring cleaning of portfolios. Stephen Cook of CFR and rising tensions between Israel and Iran. And Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab following a sell-off in US Treasuries. We begin with our top story. Stocks and bonds steady after strong factory data left traders pushing out rate cut bets once more. Troy Gajewski of FS Investments saying the performance of the US economy is an opportunity for a spring cleaning of portfolios, writing this. Cash has been a great place to hang out for quite some time and still offers a positive real rate of return, but gradually deploying those massive cash hoards into a select group of alternative strategies can substantially increase return potential without having to take on uncomfortable levels of risk. Troy, I'm pleased to say, is with us now for more. Troy, I want to reflect on the data we've had so far this week, going into a week full of economic data, really concluding with payrolls on Friday morning. Would you see that data, that strength, as a good thing or a bad thing for risk assets? Well, for, for risk assets, it still continues to be a good thing over the medium term in that stronger economic growth leads to more revenue, leads to lower default rates and credit. We're getting to that inflection point, though, where you had a violent enough curve move yesterday that equity markets finally paid attention, right? If you think of Q1, you know, you had another quarter where fixed income was down, you know, like a broken record, like we joke around about, but equities were able to power ahead because not only did you have very strong earnings, but obviously the economic growth surprises were relatively robust and Powell started to jawbone about, some would say, premature cuts. So, you know, we're, we're at a more dangerous level in terms of valuations, uh, but generally that rebound in manufacturing should be looked at as a positive outcome and a positive driver. Troy, you say the equity market started to wake up. I mean, I've got a question now. We were down 0.2% yesterday on the S&P. We're down 0.2% this morning. I think the equity market's still snoozing, isn't it? Yeah, well, compared to previous uh, higher rate-driven uh, dislocations, I mean, the most recent one, of course, was August to October of last year, where you got a material curve move. Um, and, you know, 0.2%, 0.2% is kind of a rounding error. But, you know, at 21 times forward earnings, you just have to ask yourself how much more upside do you have uh, when so much of the good news is priced in and to the points you've been making already, there's a material risk of substantially higher rates at the back end of the curve. We still are uh, fairly inverted. Uh, the curve has obviously been gradually pricing out cuts this year. Um, but bottom line is, to, to Lisa's point, in this scenario where there are no cuts, you, you have to think the back end of the curve is going higher. And we could uh, retest the 5% level at some point, given the substantial supply that's coming on um, and obviously a technical picture that's not terribly supportive. Test 5% this year? Uh, we, we have thought and we still think that's definitely possible. I mean, look, the, the way, when you think of the forward reaction function for the Fed, right, we've always said that this cutting cycle is going to be the mirror image of the 15 to 18, or sorry, this hiking cycle is going to be the mirror image of the 15 to 18 cutting cycle. Very slow and steady. And there's a reasonable probability that as the Fed first starts to cut, you know, the back end sells off as inflation expectations get anchored higher. Uh, in the event that they don't cut at all and they continue to pursue QT, which they still are, as you know, um, there's certainly a risk that we make higher highs this cycle. And that's one of the, the risks that markets have priced out, we think, far too fast, particularly late last year and early this year. Um, so, yeah, the, it, it's not that fixed income is, is tragic like it was in, you know, 2020, early 21 um, or late 21 as well. It's just that the risk reward still isn't fantastic like many people have been articulating it is. I love the idea of fixed income is tragic, uh, Troy. There is this question, though, about what assets get hit hardest. If a 10-year yield does climb back up to 5%, it starts to retest some of these levels. Is it just public equity markets or is it also some of the private markets that have seen incredible amounts of cash flow in that are kind of pegged to floating rate types of uh, instruments? Yeah, so, so I think... When you start with private credit as one example, which has been an area of tremendous growth and, and really very attractive positive returns, not only in 21 and 23, but also in 2022, where, where the index is up roughly 6 to 7% in a very tough year. Um, you know, so you're always rooting for higher front end rates for longer with the lowest probability of those that tighter Fed policy cratering the economy. Right. And that's why when we first came up with this scenario last year, we called it the dare to dream scenario because, you know, from a probability standpoint, it was almost too good to be true. But of course, that is now the base case where the Fed is hiked a lot. They're keeping rates higher for longer and the economy continues to be incredibly robust. However, to your point, if you get a high enough back end and financial conditions tighten enough, 
that could lead to slightly higher defaults over time. So you give back some of that excess income in the form of defaults. But so far what we're seeing it is very low default rates. The ability for companies to restructure with, with strong-handed both private equity and, and public equity uh, partners um, and that means less income being returned uh, through defaults, which is really as good of a scenario as you could hope for in private credit markets. I get the sense, uh, and it's not just from you, Troy, but a lot of investment managers who come on say, you know, cash, you're running out of time. You got to deploy it, whether it's alternatives, whether it's into other parts of the equity market, the, uh, you know, forgotten 493, as we heard earlier. Is there really a sort of pressure for time for cash? And no, I'm not just talking my own book, but there is this question of if the Fed's going to hold rates higher for longer and it doesn't seem like this is that restrictive, why couldn't she clip 5% on a money market fund for the foreseeable future? Oh, yeah. Look, we've argued for the last two years, right, that what you want to focus on is Northwest Quadrant strategies, strategies that have higher returns with lower risk. And, and cash actually... It is one of those uh, alternatives to uh, traditional fixed income and also equities. However, when you look at where you are today, you know, really five and a quarter, five and a half is the peak, right? The probability of the Fed hiking from here has always been non-existent. It still is non-existent. So you only have one way to go, and, and that's lower. Now, as we've discussed, it's going to be very slow, very plodding, cutting cycles. So you'll still have income. But the question is, when you think of, you know, you, whether you're looking at actuarial studies or what folks need to, to retire comfortably, typically you're in that high single digit to low teens range. And the question now is, should you at least gradually think about deploying, you know, that extra two and a half trillion in money markets, that extra four trillion in commercial bank deposits into strategies where you're not taking uncomfortable levels of risk. You're, you're not going to walk into a potential 10 or 15 percent drawdown or, or if you're in, in equities or you're reaching for duration right now, as many have done the past two years, much to their chagrin, and you take a 5 to 7 percent duration related drawdown where, where you have certainly you're conceding liquidity. You're going to have marginally more risk, uh, but you're boosting your return potential to high single digits to low teens. And, you know, one of the unique things about private credit now, which is really fascinating, is that you actually have potentially higher returns in the debt part of the capital structure than the equity part of the capital structure. Right. Because that extra debt service payments that go to the lenders comes at the expense of free cash flow for a lot of mega cap LBO firms. So the, the equity forward returns there will be lower to the benefit of the debt holder. So it's a it's it's an unusual period of market history for sure. I love how Lisa talking around book is standing cash <laughs> and for a lot of people as single names. Right. You know, but for Bramo, it's standing cash. Well, I'm just look, I'm not, you know, Showing my head too much. Actually, carry on. <laughs> we don't have to continue. Sorry, this. I want to squeeze this in. Actually, it's a random question, so forgive me for this. The FT yeah. had a strange front page yesterday, and I'd love your thoughts on it. It was about the record supply, the bond issuance we had in the corporate yes. debt market, and this really odd link about the election in the back end of this year. And I had to say, I hadn't even thought of that. Are we linking the boom in supply in the first quarter of 24 to the prospect of the market closing up in 4Q this year? You know, I think that's a bridge too far. I think what's really happened here, again, and, you know, in our investment committee meeting, we discussed that a lot of the explanatory variables for what's going on in terms of market price action, as well as in terms of risk appetite, gets back to those huge cash boards that the Fed created during, you know, the pandemic and still lurk with us today. So what, what we've seen across the board, whether it's, you know, middle market corporate lending, whether it's senior secured commercial real estate lending, whether it's high yield bonds or IG and even agency pass-throughs, which really have the horrific technicals, it is, is a gradual, steady, relentless tightening. And, and obviously issuers are taking advantage of that and they're looking at the past two years and they're thinking the next six to nine months forward, this is probably one of the better points to issue new debt and, and, and lock in new financing. Or just as critically, if you have a roll date coming, whether it's floating rate debt or fixed, you know, this is the window you're getting. And, and if we yeah. do have turbulence at the back half of the year, uh, you're probably getting better pricing now than, you know, perhaps in Q4. But I think that's a stretch. Very diplomatic, even calling it a stretch. Troy, thank you, sir. Troy Gaske of FS Investments. We'll see what we get in Q4. I certainly hadn't attributed what's happening in Q1 to what may happen later on this year. New note, Torsten Schlock, Apollo, on payrolls. This to say, the bottom line is that the improvement we have seen in the labour market in January and February is real goes on to say, combined with low jobless claims, non-farm payrolls are likely to surprise to the upside again 
in March. The number we're looking for on Friday, something in and around 200K. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here is your Bloomberg Brief with Yahira Hakes. Hey, Yahira. Hi, John. Boeing's bumpy year is being felt by pilots at United Airlines. The carrier has asked pilots to take unpaid time off next month as it grapples with delayed deliveries of new Boeing planes. The delivery delays have reduced the number of flying hours United had planned for its pilots this year. The staffing plan could be extended into the summer and potentially the fall. Rubrik, a cloud and data security startup backed by Microsoft, has filed for an IPO, disclosing growing revenue and losses. The size and price of Rubrik, Rubrik's planned share will be disclosed in a later filing. It, it, it's expected IPO follows trading debuts by Reddit and Astera Labs. The Iowa Hawkeyes are heading back to the Final Four after defending reigning champions the LSU Tigers 94-87. Iowa was led by star guard Caitlin Clark with a game-high 41 points. Tigers star Angel Reese finished with 17 points and 20 rebounds. Iowa is seeking its first title and will face the winner of the USC UConn game on Friday. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yara, thank you. Up next on the program, tensions rising between Israel and Iran. This is probably the most senior person that's been killed uh, since Soleimani and during the Trump administration. And the easiest vector for Iran to respond with would be by attacking U.S. forces in the region. For now, it looks like the U.S. is probably going to be its main target. That conversation, I'm next, live from New York City. Good morning. Equities on the S&P 500, a little bit lower, negative by a quarter of 1% on the S&P. Crude up by 1.8%, $85 on WTI. Under surveillance this morning, rising tensions between Israel and Iran. This is probably the most senior person that's been killed uh, since Soleimani and during the Trump administration. And the easiest vector for Iran to respond with would be by attacking U.S. forces in the region. And the other vector for escalation that's really the more worrisome one would be one of Iranian proxies like Hezbollah attacking Israel from the north. So far, Iran has not seemed to want to escalate in that manner. And for now, it looks like the U.S. is probably going to be its main target. It's the latest this morning. Iran vowing revenge on Israel after a strike on its embassy in Syria killed at least seven military personnel. The strike marking a rare direct confrontation between the two as the proxy conflict over the war in Gaza threatens to escalate. Joining us now to discuss is Stephen Cook of the Council on Foreign Relations. Stephen, wonderful to get your insight, your valuable insight on this program this morning. Could you talk us to us about possible consequences from that strike in Damascus? Yeah, this is a significant escalation and the risk of the Iranians uh, responding in any number of ways uh, is very, very high. Um, the Iranians have um, attacked American forces and American forces are in Iraq and Iran, which are obvious places. We've seen that happen over the course of the conflict that began on October 7th. Uh, there is also the very real possibility that whatever restraints the Iranians have placed on Lebanon's Hezbollah may start to loosen. Um, there's already um, a very significant conflict between Israel and Hezbollah. Um, the, two, the two have been trading uh, fire since October 7th, and strikes against each other's countries have been getting bolder and deeper in recent weeks and months. So um, this is a, a, a very big step for the Israelis, who quite rightly point out that the multi-front conflict that they are fighting um, is a consequence of the Iranian sponsorship of the axis of resistance um, in the north, um, obviously in Gaza, as well as the Houthis' uh, unrelenting fire on Israel uh, from Yemen. So um, the Israelis clearly want to go after what they consider to be the head of the snake. Iranian Foreign Minister Amir Abdullian in the early hours this morning said that he summoned the uh, Switzerland envoy to give a message to the United States. Potentially this is also going on with maybe back channels in Oman. What kind of back channel do you see potentially between Washington and Tehran to try to take the temperature down? There is um, and has long been uh, robust communication between Tehran and Washington through the Swiss embassy. 
um, the United States um, communicated to the Iranians at the outset of the conflict, communicated to the Iranians after the incident in Tower 22, when three American soldiers were killed, that the Iranians um, needed to back off, otherwise there would be very significant consequences for them. I imagine the Iranians are using that in reverse, uh, communicating to the United States that uh, unless uh, Washington brings the Israelis to heal, um, the Iranians have the capability of uh, raising a storm of violence in the region. How close are the Americans to bringing the Israelis to heel, given the fact that they had this call yesterday, a strategic call, and then potentially we are going to see Israeli officials in Washington next week? I think that the American influence on the Israelis at this point is rather limited. The Israelis uh, frame their conflict with Hamas, and in fact, their conflict on multiple fronts as an existential threat. Under those circumstances, although the United States is a uh, obviously uh, an important strategic partner of the Israelis, um, advice given is not always advice taken. We have seen this throughout the conflict. Um, President Biden believed that his bear hug of the Israeli government would give him the leverage with the Israelis to shape their military operations in the Gaza Strip. That has not happened. So um, uh, the conversations between um, Washington and Jerusalem yesterday, virtually in next week's meetings, are about uh, Israeli military, planned military operations in Rafah. Um, Prime Minister Netanyahu said those plans have been approved and the IDF is uh, ready to execute them. Um, it's unclear um, whether these talks will bear fruit for the United States in shaping the way the Israelis uh, undertake this uh, this operation. Stephen, there are a lot of moving pieces here, and you honed in on the northern border of Israel, the border with Lebanon, the Hezbollah conflict that has been ongoing for a long time, the tit-for-tat, and that being the true source of an escalation that could draw in a larger swath of the region and potentially disrupt things like oil markets. I'm wondering how close you think we are to that. If you could quantify how much closer we are now after these assassinations than we were before them, it would be really important because this is really what a lot of uh, strategists are honing in on this morning. Well, it's hard to put numbers on it, especially for a historically minded political scientist like myself. But I would say that it is um, a, a strong likelihood that we will see a, a significant conflict between Israel and Hezbollah in the north. Uh, the constraints on both parties have been loosening uh, in recent weeks and months. Um, the strike in Damascus yesterday that killed two IRGC generals um, are something that the Iranians are going to be unable to not respond to. Um, I think the only thing really holding the Israelis back right now is in an, in an odd and twisted way is congressional dysfunction. Um, the Israelis need that security assistance that has been locked in Congress in order to acquire the kind of precision munitions they would like to use in a conflict with Hezbollah. Um, but I think uh, in the next uh, four or six months, we're likely to see a major escalation in the in the north. What's to stop that from percolating out into a broader region that really does disrupt broader trade markets in a way that a lot of people have suspected was the worst case scenario? Yeah, I think the, the major factor here is, is that the uh, Israelis and Hezbollah get involved in a major conflict, that the uh, Iranians and the Houthis continue to interfere with global shipping and the, meaning also for the oil markets. Um, neither Israel nor Lebanon are major players in the energy markets, although there's a lot of gas off both their coasts. But the, the knock on effects in which uh, Iran and its axis of resistance can disrupt the global economy, as they've done or tried to do in the Red Sea, um, is something that I think everybody needs to be uh, well aware of. Stephen, appreciate your time this morning. Thanks for your insights, Thank sir. You. Stephen Cook there of CFR. Need to talk about this crude market, don't we? Can we play the what if, just briefly? We've got Brent crude near to 89, WTI 85. What if crude output in America was not 13.1 million barrels a day? Can you imagine where this crude market would be? It would be a very different story. And that's the reason why people are looking at this and saying, especially at a time where it's not clear how much more the U.S. can ramp up production from here, how much can that serve as an offset if there is some sort of major disruption? And could they potentially put pressure on OPEC Plus to get more involved? There is a critical meeting happening this week, and I'm not even talking about the JMMC meeting that's happening because it's likely that they're going to continue on the supply cuts. But Jake Sullivan's going to Riyadh, along with Brett McGurk and Amos Hochstein, talking about normalization, according to Axios. I don't think anyone thinks in this kind of Middle East market you could see normalization with what's going on in Gaza, but potentially they're going to talk about the oil market. Remember how the Saudis responded going into the midterms last time around? I wonder how different it'll be this time around going into the election. Do you think they've got a, a winner in mind? Is that something that they want to sway? It was the smallest increase. It almost felt like a cut. Yep.
Equities right now on the S&P 500, negative by 0.3%. Up next on this program, the yen weakening on strong U.S. factory data, raising the risk of intervention. That conversation up next with Mark Chandler of Bannockburn from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Equities on the S&P 500 futures this morning look a little something like this. We're negative on the S&P by 0.3%, down on the Nasdaq by 0.4%. Underperformance on the Russell, the small caps down by about a half of 1%. We'll talk about the small caps a little bit later. Bramo's super keen. Well, I mean, this is the whole question, right? I mean, people say broadening out, but how far can you get a broadening out if it also is accompanied by higher yields? I don't know. First thing Bramo said when she sat at the desk this morning, does it derail the rotation. Does this derail the rotation? Let's check out the bond market together. Two year, 10 year, 30 year. We'll talk about some levels. Let's start with the 10 year. New high for the year. Yields up five basis points, 435.71. On a two year at the moment, up a single basis point to 471.59. If you're interested in the highest level of the year so far, that was in the middle of March. It was 474.89, not a million miles away at the moment. That yield curve, Lisa, just shifting higher in the last 24 hours. And it's been sustainable. It hasn't been necessarily the shock move that has caused people to flee risk assets. It's been sort of, well, it's come from good intentions, the idea that we're seeing more robust growth and more robust demand. This is the reason why I thought it was interesting, Troy Gajewski saying there's a level at which it will hurt, but we're not there yet. What is that level? Are we sufficiently restrictive? Is this going to be a problem for an economy that seems to be chugging along? This from City's Andrew Honhorst. I'd love your thoughts on this. Has this to say about Chairman Powell? His comments suggest the Fed is on track for cuts. And more important than the ISM manufacturing barely above 50.0, the Fed reaction function now places a larger weight on labor market data. And we see downside risk to Friday's jobs report, projecting a 150,000 increase in payrolls on Friday. I think this for me is the big issue. Where is the greater emphasis at the moment? It's a question we sort of lent on yesterday repeatedly. What's the biggest number? Payrolls on Friday or CPI out next week? People would say it should be CPI, but it's going to be the payrolls number, right? It's going to be very much a sort of uh, job-dependent Fed that wants to protect the economy. We don't know, and that's part of the issue. This is a Fed that wants to cut rates. Question is, when we start to reach a point where inflation really is creeping back in, we didn't see that with, for example, the University of Michigan survey that came out on Friday. Inflation expectations were not coming up. So it doesn't seem like that's pressuring them. If that changes, how much does that change where the emphasis has to be for a Fed that ultimately has to deal with the mandate of bringing inflation back to 2%? Steve Rusciutto of Mizuho sat right here just, what, two weeks ago? And he said, this Fed wants to cut. Will the data cooperate? We'll see. Let's turn to the commodity board and take a look at crude together. What's happening with Brent and WTI? Brent crude getting very close to 90, 88.69. WTI through 85 early this morning. Copper back through 9K. We've seen that development over the last month or so. Gold, six-day winning streak. And Anne-Marie, another all-time high on gold as well. The commodity market breaking out. And what's curious about all of this to me is the recipe for a higher crude price was there in October. It was there in November. It was present in December and we ignored it. And all of a sudden, the last month is all coming together and we're starting to break out. Well, one of the big things is analysts were saying that supply actually wasn't impacted after the October 7th attack. But now when you have this escalation, which everyone is talking about, the greatest escalation since the killing of Qasem Soleimani under the Trump administration, now this means there's going to be an upside of risk premium. Then you look at the demand side, manufacturing coming out of China, and then you look at the supply side. OPEC Plus is not willing to step in right now. And what you're seeing is they're potentially going to continue ratcheting back that supply. So every dynamic is pointing to higher crude prices coming down the line. Higher crude prices right now on the screen. Brent crude, 88.69. Under surveillance this morning, traders pushing back bets on the timing of rate cuts following better than expected U.S. factory data. ISM manufacturing showing expansion for the first time since 2022. The data reinforcing the Fed's patient outlook on rate cuts. More Fed speak on tap today. We'll hear from Bellman, Williams, Mester, Daly, ahead of Chairman Powell tomorrow. Bramo, we've got so much Fed speak this week. What are you looking for from all these officials through the week? Do Raphael Bostic and Neil Kashkari have friends? Have lunch together. <laughs> that is my one question. How much are they sitting there in the lunchroom kind of muttering, why don't other people see what we're seeing? We can cut once and then be done with it. I mean, seriously, at a certain point, how much do other people realize this isn't necessarily all that restrictive if we still see this kind of growth? Does the message change from Chairman Powell? 
heard from him a couple of times. Do you think it really changes tomorrow? I mean, it won't change tomorrow, considering the fact that it didn't change uh, at the end of last week. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. I, I honestly don't know, if you're looking for data, what data supports the idea of prices paid going to the highest since 2022 and higher manufacturing data than the commodity space? I keep going back to that. Isn't that sort of the gut check uh, that this is something broader? Well, it felt like Chairman Powell potentially moved a baby step towards Waller on Friday. And I was saying how it's so boring to hear him on Wednesday because we already heard from him after PC and it's going to be before jobs. But now it's a little bit more interesting potentially hearing him after factory, after prices paid and what we're seeing in terms of geopolitical risk. Does he have to say anything about this? You get way more Fed officials through the week if you're staffed of Fed speakers. What did I say yesterday? I think you're not going to be on a diet this week of Fed speak. That's for sure. There is tons of Fed speak. I want to turn to this story from Tesla. Shares in the pre-market a little bit lower. So the EV maker reporting quarterly sales data later this morning. The average estimate in our survey calling for about 450,000 deliveries. That's a drop of more than 7% from the previous quarter. Falling demand, higher rates, taking a bit of a toll on orders. The shares... The stock is down by about 30% so far this year. It's the worst performer on the S&P 500. There are massive competitive issues in places like China. We've said a few times on this program this week that you'll struggle to find, you'll really struggle to find many sectors in many regions that are more competitive, as competitive, as what is happening in the auto sector in China. And a great example of that is what happened with Tesla this week. They flagged prices were going to go up. Maybe that was a strategy for, to get people to order ahead of time before that price increase. What did NEO do on the same day? Provides for up to $138 million of incentives for drivers of gasoline cars to make a switch. Cherry Automobile came out and said it will cover the cost of purchase taxes on selected models, plus offered better trade-in for customers' used cars as well. These stories, Lisa, that market just gets more and more competitive. Tesla's been trying to make itself out as something more than a car company. And it's been hampered by the fact that ultimately people are looking at it increasingly as a car company. And if that's the case, its valuation doesn't make sense. I will just say, maybe this is going to be the key moment where we either say it is part of the MAG-7 or has officially been booted from that special select group. It's taken the boot in Q1, that's for sure, in a major way. Let's turn to Japan to talk about foreign exchange. The yen weakening towards 152, making its biggest single-day move in over a week after strong U.S. factory data boosted the dollar. Traders on high alert following comments from the Japanese finance minister that authorities are prepared to take appropriate measures against what they call excessive moves. Joining us now to discuss is Mark Chandler, Chief Market strategist of Bannockburn. Mark, I want to talk about foreign exchange and the price action of yesterday. It was interesting just taking a snapshot of G10, WCRS on the Bloomberg terminal. I think it pictured things beautifully. Everything was weaker against the US dollar, but the relative outperformance was the Japanese yen. Just a touch of weakness. And I wonder, Mark, whether that was the first real sign that this market was taking the prospect of intervention quite seriously. Yeah, good morning, John. Yeah, I think that you're, you're right. I mean, but I don't think it was just yesterday that the market's been taking the Bank of Japan intervention seriously. You know, we've been knocking just slightly shy of that 152 level, and the market's been really hesitant about taking us over that level for fear of BOJ intervention, partly because the last time they intervened, October 2022, and it was around that 152 level. What do you think intervention is actually going to look like, Mark, if they do intervene, if we do breach 152? What does it look like? Yeah, I think that the Japanese made a mistake, a tactical error, by not intervening uh, at the end of last week in thin markets when the U.S. and European markets were closed. What I'm looking at is, as you mentioned, uh, I think the consensus is for a relatively uh, robust, at least a, a, a decent uh, U.S. jobs report on Friday and a firm CPI next week. So I think the dollar is going to move, uh, move higher on the back of that. We're already getting some advance to that. And I think that the, the Japanese, by not intervening, uh, they're going to be sort of forced to put the toothpaste back in the tube, so to speak, sort of reactionary, rather than first depress the dollar yen, so then it can rally on the data and not have to take out that 152 level. I think they're worried that if we go above 152, we could go to 155, 157. Some people are betting that they're not going to put the toothpaste back in the tube, that they've got no willingness or ability to do so, including, it seems like, Mark Mobius, who is on Bloomberg television. And he basically said there's no way that they, uh, the Japanese authorities, are going to do anything to strengthen the yen, that there isn't the appetite, there wasn't at the end of last week, and there won't be going forward. How dangerous is it to bet that the yen will continue to weaken despite some of the verbal uh, intervention attempts that we've heard? Yeah, I think that the market, you know, a lot of the... Uh 
so I think a, a, lot, a large market segment is already shifting from sort of using the yen as a funding currency to moving to the Swiss franc as a funding currency. Uh, the, the, you can see that even today, where the Swiss franc is the weakest of the major currencies. And we also get a, a CPI data from the Swiss next week, excuse me, tomorrow. And they already cut interest rates once. And I think the market's saying they'll cut interest rates again in June. And so I think that the market's already making this adjustment. I think it's just, it's really, I think it comes down to risk reward. Uh, is the risk reward there to be, uh, to be adding on to short yen positions right now? And I think the market is rightfully being cautious about it. I do think the BOJs will intervene. Uh, like I said, I think they made a tactical error by not intervening uh, when they had a chance in the thin markets. But I, I think that's the only way to at least uh, using these code words like watching the market urgently or with a sense of urgency or we'll do anything, uh, not ruling out any options. I think these are all word cues of intervention. And if they don't make good on it, I think it sort of dilutes uh, the, sort of the street credibility. There's a bigger point that you made within that, mm -hmm. that basically mm -hmm. this is as much a Swiss franc story as it is a Japanese yen story. And if you zoom out even mm -hmm. further, mm -hmm. I wonder how much a global rate cutting cycle actually helps some of the weaker currencies and hurts the likes of the Swiss franc, like the dollar. If you do get this idea mm -hmm. that we are shifting away from what people thought were restrictive policies. Yeah, you know, it's, it's really remarkable. You know, uh, I think that not only has the market moved away from a Fed cut in June, but uh, when I just looked at the Fed funds futures, the market's not even fully pricing in the cut in July. And you know, yesterday we saw the Atlanta Fed GDP tracker uh, tick up to a 2.8 percent. And so I, I think you're right. I think that in a strong dollar environment, uh, the carry trades still look attractive, and we shift to different ones for funding currencies. Mexican peso is the only major. I should say it's the only. Uh, emerging market currency, the only major currency, even the G10 currencies that are higher on the year. And I think that's reflecting that carry trade. Hey, Mark, good to touch base with you again. Let's catch up again soon. Mark Chandler there of Bannockburg on what's happening in the FX market, particularly dollar yen. Let's do some scenario analysis. So Thanos Van Bikidis of Bank of America caught up with Guy and Critty in London on their show. And this is what he had to say. The yen could slide to 160 per dollar unless the Federal Reserve cuts interest rates this year. Described intervention is very likely, but it would be more likely that they would be leaning against the wind. Leaning against the wind if they do intervene and goes on to say the yen could rally to 142, but a lot of this is central bank independent. It's Federal Reserve independent. It can go to 142 if the Fed goes ahead with cuts, as expected by markets. Which raises a question, do, do Japanese authorities have the ability to really intervene even if they wanted to, right? Essentially, that indicates not so much, and that's what we heard from Mark Mobius, too. The fact that they didn't make a move last week tells you a lot, maybe that they're counting on the Fed to continue with their what they promised. Dolly Yen, 151.65. Let's give an update on stories elsewhere. Let's check in with your Bloomberg Brief. Here's Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. UBS says it plans to buy back up to $2 billion of its shares, with up to $1 billion of that total expected to take place this year. The Swiss bank confirming the share repurchase plan today after having suspended its previous plan a year ago amid its takeover of former rival Credit Suisse. The bank said it expects to complete the merger by the end of the second quarter. Meanwhile, at Citi, more job cuts. A fresh round of reductions at its investment bank saw managing directors in the technology, media and telecom division, plus equity capital market space, leave the Wall Street lender. The latest cuts coming as Citigroup says it's wrapped up the major action surrounding its reorganization plan, which aimed to streamline operations by eliminating 20,000 roles. And Disney is in the lead in its, pro in its proxy battle against Nelson, Nelson Peltz's try-in partners, with more than half of all votes cast. That's according to the Wall Street Journal. The paper says BlackRock and T. Rowe Price are among the major investors backing Disney. The journal says investors are still casting votes and can change them through the annual meeting tomorrow. Peltz is seeking a board seat for himself and former Dis Disney CFO Jay Rasulo. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. Up next on this program, pricing in a patient Fed. In the scenario where there are no cuts, you, you have to think the back end of the curve is going higher, and we could uh, retest the 5% level at some point. There's certainly a risk that we make higher highs this cycle. Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab, just around the corner from New York. This is Bloomberg.
Stocks down 31% on the S&P 500. Yields higher on a 10-year new high for 2024 at four basis points, 4.35.51. Under surveillance this morning, pricing in a patient Fed. In the scenario where there are no cuts, you have to think the back end of the curve is going higher, and we could uh, retest the 5% level at some point, given the substantial supply that's coming on, um, and obviously a technical picture that's not terribly supportive. There's a reasonable probability that as the Fed first starts to cut, you know, the back end sells off as inflation expectations get anchored higher. Uh, in the event that they don't cut at all, there's certainly a risk that we make higher highs this cycle. Here's the latest this morning. Treasury selling off after strong U.S. factory data pushed the odds of a June rate cut below 50 percent. Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab writes in this. The economy is doing well, and that's the big problem for the bond market. It keeps the Fed on hold for longer, waiting for either inflation to fall decisively or the job market to slow. Neither the inflation data nor the job data appear likely to provide a breakout moment in the near term, and that's likely to mean more choppy trading. Cathy, I'm pleased to say, is with us now for more. Cathy, your asset class, together with the commodity market, are the two asset classes to watch right now. Ten year, in the last few hours this morning, new high of the year, 436.51. Cathy, what is the strongest argument to buy the long end of the curve this morning? Well, I, I think the strongest argument is that inflation is still falling. And I know we've got a lot of excitement around commodity prices uh, going on right now. But in general, what we're seeing is the trend is still lower in inflation. The core PCE is in the mid to low twos. Uh, I think CPI will continue to, core CPI will continue to ease down. We're probably going to see a somewhat slower growth rate in the job market. So. Um, we're in a soft landing, which is great. The economy is doing well, and um, that's all very positive. But um, the overall trend in inflation is still going in the right direction, and that's the strongest argument for buying extending duration in the bond market. Kathy, I believe last time we spoke, you talked about rate cuts might not begin until July. Is that the buy still for you, middle of the summer, or are you pushing that out just a little bit? Well, we haven't pushed it out yet. Obviously, we want to wait and see some more data, uh, just as the Fed is waiting to see more data um, on inflation and then particularly in the labor market to, to make that call. But right now, yeah, we're, we're still looking at a couple of rate cuts in the second half of the year, but not starting until July, because um, obviously the Fed wants to wait and see how things are going. And actually taking no action is right now is probably the best course of action for them to take. Um, instead of making a mistake one direction or another, they can just sit tight for a while. Kathy, John asked me a question earlier this morning, and I really had no good answer to it, which is, which is a more important data point for the Federal Reserve, either uh, the jobs report that we get on Friday or CPI next week. What do you think? Because ultimately, it seems like the jobs market is almost more important to this Federal Reserve. I would say so. With the inflation now kind of in the range where the Fed would like it to be, unless it breaks out substantially one direction or another, um, I think the focus can shift to the job market. If you were to start to see substantial softness in the job market, uh, then I think the Fed would be more inclined to move more quickly because that would imply a slowdown in consumer spending down the road. Uh, again, it remains to be seen, but I think right now jobs take on a much uh, bigger proportion of the thinking at the Fed than, uh, than the inflation numbers. What about the other side of that? What if the jobs number is actually significantly higher than expected or comes in strong the way it has been for a number of months now and we do see wages remaining sticky? Will you reset your view of where longer term rates could potentially go just based on the idea that maybe these rates aren't all that restrictive? Yeah, uh, we'll have to adjust as the data adjusts right now. Um, average hourly earnings are running about 4.1% year over year. They've been in that low 4% area for a while after having peaked at much higher levels. If it fails to come down, because uh, I think the Fed's comfort level is probably closer to 3 3.5%, Assuming we continue to get some decent productivity, that's not a bad story for the inflation outlook or for the bond market. But if those wages tick up or stay sticky at 4%, then we'd have to adjust um, our expectations for the Fed and, and for the bond market. Kathy, how divided do you think this FOMC is? When you look at the dot plot relative to the last set of projections in December, it looks like things have tightened up. But when you listen to the conversations, the speeches, the rhetoric, it looks like there's some distance between the likes of President Bostic and maybe others on the committee. Just how divided, how united is this FOMC? 
Well, no doubt they'll probably try to come up with a, uh, you know, a consensus opinion at the next meeting. But uh, Bostic is an interesting person to follow because he has been a bit on the leading edge of Fed decision making. So um, I think that um, he's probably going to build a, a bigger faction uh, if the data stay relatively strong, you'll probably see more people migrate over there. But again, I, I also keep in mind that this is very fluid. The decision making is very fluid. I don't think anybody is too anchored uh, to the soft view, to the dovish view. Um, Paul seems to be probably the most dovish, publicly speaking. But I don't know that he's 100% anchored to that if the data change, you know, he'll change his mind. Kathy, his dovish stance has prompted some people to talk about maybe a lack of commitment to that 2% inflation target. And some people might draw a line between that and what's happening with gold, what's happening with treasuries this morning. Is that a step too far for you? It is. I don't think the Fed has given any indication they've given up on the 2% target on inflation. I, I don't think that they will. I don't see why they would. Uh, with the economy doing as well as it is, they can stand pat and push for lower inflation. So now, I, you know, what's going on in gold, what's going on in, in other markets, um, there's always a narrative around it. And my experience with gold is there's always a narrative around it. And it usually includes some sort of inflation and monetary policy story. Uh, but I don't know that any of that has changed for the, the U.S. Um, we've been no indication from the Fed they're giving up on 2%. There's also always a narrative around oil prices. And one of the questions has always been the perennial question, is it inflationary or disinflationary when prices go up significantly because it could act as a damper, uh, a dampening effect on growth, or it could spur prices to increase in a robust economy. This time around, which is it? How concerning is it to see oil prices really ticking up to the highs of the year? What's interesting about the rise in oil prices to me is that um, it is not, um, there's no evidence that we're supply constrained. So this is all the expectation that demand is going to, to ramp up, right? And so we'll have to see if that becomes the case. We do have you know, China maybe doing a little bit better than expected in the U.S. manufacturing sector, showed signs of life. Um, it seems to be an anticipation of demand. It is not, you know, super cycles and commodities usually are, derived from the fact that we've underinvested for a long period of time in commodities. And that certainly isn't the case now. We're, we're pumping record amounts of oil. So this has to be a demand story. And we'll see how far that carries um, if economic growth doesn't accelerate from here. But for consumers, uh, it ultimately becomes a tax on consumption. They have to shift consumption from somewhere else to pay for higher um, gasoline prices at the pump. So um, I think it has more of a negative effect on economic growth at the end of the day than positive. Hey, Kathy, wonderful to catch up with you. Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab on Treasury yields breaking out to new highs for 2024. New highs for crude as well. Brent crude, very close to 89. New note from Peter Chair over at Academy. Israeli airstrike on Iranian consulate definitely impacting crude. And that pressure on oil translating into higher bond yields at the longer end as the inflation and potentially military spending on escalation is outweighing any flight to safety. AMH crude at 1.5 percent. Yeah, and this is the risk premium we've been talking about that we haven't seen since October really start to come into the market. Given the escalation of this strike, who was the individual that was hit and what was hit? This was a government building in Damascus for the Iranians, and they've already come out and said they will have to respond. What that response looked like remains to be seen, but everyone's talking about potentially Iran likes to do this through proxies. Is it Hezbollah? Is it more Houthi attacks? Is it potentially going to maybe escalate into the Indian Ocean? We don't know yet, but there will be an escalation. Lisa, escalation risk front and center in that commodity market. The reason why this is nervous, nerve wracking for the bond market, though, is what Kathy said, is that on one hand, this could be some sort of disruption to supply, but this is much more of a story that is driven by demand. And that is something that is more inflationary, at least in the short term, because it can continue. And it's not because of a supply shock. It's because of growth and it's because of sustainability sustained resilience and potentially even a stronger China. Showing up in crude, showing up in gold, showing up in treasuries as well. The conversation continues. The third hour of Bloomberg Surveillance up next. David Leibovitz of JP Morgan Asset Management with us around the table. And Rita Sen of Energy Aspects as crude breaks out to new highs for 2024. Lorena Urici of T. Rowe Price and Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow on Tesla numbers coming out a little bit later this morning.
We're at an inflection point in the Fed's policy path and in the Fed's communications. We're starting to see sort of a different kind of Fed narrative evolve this year. There's been some rising angst, but still I think the cuts are on the table. There's a little bit of froth, and maybe it's deserved, as you see Powell kind of shift his narrative to things that allow him to cut. The important thing is that the Fed and markets are in sync after being out of sync. If you look at the market expectations of where interest rates are gonna go, the Fed is actually a lot more optimistic about the scope for rate cuts over the next few years. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. The third hour of Bloomberg Surveillance begins right now, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, your equity market just a little bit softer. The headlines are firmly elsewhere in the commodity market, in the bond market as well. Ten-year yields at new highs for 2024 and reflecting on the data of yesterday. Strong upside surprises for U.S. manufacturing. Prices paid coming in a little bit firmer as well. And one question we've all got, does it derail the prospect of rate cuts anytime soon from this Federal Reserve? City's Andrew Hottenhorst taking the other side of this conversation today. The Fed reaction function now places a larger weight on labor market data. They see downside risk going into payrolls Friday. They look, Lisa, for 150. Kathy Jones was agreeing that basically the labor market data really does take precedence. This is the concern, though, that some people have. What are they looking for in the labor market data? Is 150 enough to get it done, given the fact that you're still seeing inflation under the hood, you're still seeing robust uh, data prints, including the ISM manufacturing report that highlighted how much commodity prices are feeding into higher prices for goods? So this is what you're waking up to this morning in the bond market, 436 on a U.S. 10-year. Yields once again bleeding higher in the commodity market, getting closer and closer to 90 on Brent crude, breaching 89 earlier on this morning and backing away just a touch, 85 on WTI. This from Peter Chair and Marie over at Academy Securities. The Israeli airstrike on the Iranian consulate in Damascus definitely impacting oil prices, that pressure on crude, translating into higher bond yields at the longer end as the inflation and potential military spending on escalation is outweighing any flight to safety. That strike certainly had a heightened G geopolitical risk into the oil market. What everyone is describing this as in the foreign policy world across Israeli newspapers is this is the biggest risk in terms of the biggest hit to Iran since the assassination of Qasem Soleimani. Iran already says they have to respond. What is the response and how much will risk potentially there be? That's what the market's pricing in. But then you take a step back. We know that demand is potentially picking up in China and OPEC plus still has supply constraints. So three different movements within the oil market are all moving to say bullish on oil. The demand piece of this, I think, is the fresher piece of this. Back in October, we had the recipe for escalation. It was the number one question we were talking about ever since the terrorist attack in Israel. Escalation risk, the prospect of a regional conflict. The demand turn that we've started to see in manufacturing, the turn in China, expansion, the official read for the first time in five months, the first time in 16 months, a year and a half for the United States. That's a fresh ingredient to all of this. Which gives it more lasting power. It looks like less of a potential near-term disruption and longer-term, just sort of lower for longer kind of feel in, in oil prices to something more sustainable. Even, Kathy put, pointed this out, and I thought this was really a, a good point. This is coming even with record production of U.S. oil. So it raises this question of, especially if China is just beginning to get back online, if you do get upside, how much that continues to fuel both the sell-off in bonds as well as inflation expectations. Let's throw up the market broadly. So look at this. Equities down yesterday by 0.2%. Given the way everything else has lined up, would you expect to see equity futures down just 0.4% given what we're seeing elsewhere on the board? Given the fact that we've gone up more than 10% in the first quarter and that basically every dip has been viable, even if the dip barely registers on the screen, I mean, I guess we've all sort of been benumbed to the momentum trade that seems to never give up. This is really the key question, though. At a certain point, if you get yields high enough, do you get a bigger impact on stocks beyond the Magnificent Seven that everyone's hoping can rally, even despite some of the higher yields we see? That yield, that number on the screen right now, 436.51, that's a new high for 2024 on a US. 10-year yield, yield tired by something like four, five, six basis points throughout this morning. Coming up this hour, David Leibovitz of JP Morgan Asset Management as investors push back rate cut 
bets and rear descent of energy aspects as WTI tops $85 for the first time since October. And Blarina Yurici of T. Rowe Price are looking ahead to Friday's payrolls report. We begin with our top story. The odds of a June rate cut dipping below 50% on the heels of stronger than expected manufacturing data. Investors now looking to a slew of Fed speak ahead of Friday's jobs report. David Leibovitz of JP Morgan Asset Management expecting the Fed to stay the course, saying, quote, we continue to expect progress in the cooling of U.S. inflation and for the Fed to look through any minor bumps along the way. David, I'm pleased to say, is with us for more. So, David, is this a bump in the road? The ISM yesterday, the price is paid, the rally in crude. Are they just bumps in the road? So I, I think that there are a couple of important things to, to recognize. One, <clears throat> to the point you were making earlier, we've been looking for manufacturing activity to pick up for a year and a half. It's finally beginning to pick up. So I'm, I'm not sure that this is necessarily new information, and I think that to an extent uh, it aligns with what people were expecting. I think the bigger question is going to be what happens with things like crude oil, because in the, in the short term, right, that will be inflationary. The Fed will probably look through it. But if oil prices move higher and stay higher, there's usually about a six to eight quarter lag. And then that begins to show up in pricing pressure more broadly. The counterpoint to that is that higher oil prices are a tax on the consumer. And so I think what you end up with is this tug of war whereby if energy prices go up for the summer and then come back down in the fall, I think the Fed is willing to take that in stride if energy prices move higher, stay higher, because we don't get that increase in supply from OPEC+, plus, then maybe the Fed feels a little bit uh, uncertain about the path of inflation going forward. Bear with me here. But the data's been messy, and yeah. people dismiss <laughs> it and call it bumps in the road very frequently, and it's giving me a little bit of agita, just simply because everyone's been looking to try to dismiss things as aberrations until they become a pattern. At what point can we look to oil prices and commodity prices as the best data that we have in terms of demand globally and how much and how robust the economy is? Well, and I think that, that that's really the key question, because to my point about manufacturing earlier, people have really been looking for a pickup in global manufacturing more so than U.S. manufacturing. And so because the U.S. has been able to keep its head above water, is this to an extent an, an indication of things to come? Are we going to get better numbers out of China? better numbers out of the U.S. That helps lift Europe out of the doldrums that it's been in for the last couple of quarters. This is how you get to a scenario where you get that resiliency in growth and you don't necessarily get that rebalancing between growth and inflation, particularly in the United States, as quickly as what people were expecting. But if you're the Fed, and I want to come back to something that you guys were saying earlier, I do think that the labor market is carrying more weight. I don't think that they're exclusively focused on the labor market data, but the messaging seems to be that they're comfortable with inflation kind of moving along the path that they laid out in the summary of economic projections, which is still above 2%. And so to me, this is a Fed that cares less about getting to two and more about preserving and extending the expansion. The survey that we have is a little bit north of 200,000 to be added for the payrolls on yep. Friday. If the Fed is looking at the labor market, what do they need to see to say, okay, this is a slowdown? So to me, the, the best indicator has always been jobless claims. You know, we get it every single week. It's the highest frequency. It's, it's arguably the most contemporaneous thing you're going to get. I also think just looking at some of the survey data, I mean, there, there's always there, over the years, we've seen these disconnects between the hard data and the soft data, and we get ourselves all wrapped around our finger. You know, just kind of look at what the balance of data is saying. And what you're clearly seeing from the surveys, which tend to be a bit more forward looking, is that there is more resiliency in the labor market. The economy continues to power forward. Atlanta Fed GDP now is still above our estimate of trend growth. So we're, we're kind of getting what we want, right, which is a sequential slowing in growth. And we think that over time, that'll bring inflation back down to levels that are more comfortable for the Fed. It's just not happening as quickly as what everybody was looking for coming into this year. Let's get to the stock market and talk about what everyone was looking for coming into Q2. They were looking for a big rotation. Equity futures right now Equity futures show the S&P down by 0.4%, the Russell underperforming by, let's call it, 0.7% lower on the morning. Lisa asked a few times this morning whether the recipe we're seeing come together elsewhere in crude, in the commodity market, in bonds as well, is a reason to encourage that rotation that everyone is looking for or a reason to derail it? So I think it encourages the rotation. I mean, you've seen pretty favorable technicals up until this point with a number of stocks above their 200-day moving average, regardless of the sector that you're looking at. And you know, a big part of our thesis coming into this year was that you, know, you were going to see that earnings story begin to broaden out. It wasn't just going to be about the magnificent four, five, six, seven, whatever number of companies are in there today. You were going to see financials act better. You were going to see the commodity complex act better. And I think that this uptick in manufacturing data, higher crude prices, all of that lends itself to that broadening out and that extension 
right, of the rally that we've seen since October of last year. And so I actually think that while these may be challenging developments on the inflation front, they're arguably positive developments for the U.S. equity market. And I would also remind everybody that in 2022, when everyone was freaked out that higher inflation was bad for the stock market, well, it's actually good for corporate profits. And if that's what we need going forward, given that multiples have driven this rally, arguably the earnings story is looking a bit more positive. I'm actually sitting here incredibly confused. I'm sitting here thinking, how does the Fed justify cutting rates if what we're seeing right now with respect to inflation and demand is incredibly positive for corporate profits, is an incredibly positive development for the economy? How does it lead you to cutting rates that then give some sort of fuel to also the bond market? It's not really adding up to me. No, and I think that that's, that's very fair. And I'm not going to say that, you know, well, if inflation's coming down and the Fed's not doing anything, that inherently tightens policy because Powell put that to bed a few weeks ago. But that would have been the argument at that point in time. I, I think that this is increasingly becoming a credibility issue. You know, the Fed started hiking too late, which undermined their credibility to an extent. They doubled down on the three cuts at the, uh, the March uh, Fed meeting. Do we get those three cuts between now and the end of the year? We think two to three is, is probably reasonable. But I think that the Fed has kind of locked themselves into some sort of easing this year, and it's going to get easier. And they actually did it in the forecasts that they released last month. They pushed out some of those cuts from 2025 you know, and brought down the overall number expected over the three-year horizon. And so this is very much a, a time management game for the Fed more than anything else. You know, They want to give the market what it wants in the form of easier policy. But I do think they recognize that the risk is, is overdue doing it to the downside. If that's truly the thesis then, wouldn't you sell the long bond aggressively, get out completely, go into the front end, buy stocks and call it a day? That's kind of what we're doing. I mean, we're, <laughs> okay, we're, well, we're, we're, gener we're generally playing duration from the long side because we do think over a 12 to 18 month period, it can be viewed as a hedge against softer growth, but much more comfortable in, in the short to intermediate end of the curve, still overweight equities and actually upgrading our views on some of the, the non-US markets, particularly EMX China. You know, we remain fairly glass half full from a portfolio perspective and we continue to implement those trades. What's that, um, T-bills, the S&P and chill? Yeah, exactly. That's, the term. that's the phrase, right? Exactly. <laughs> or the, the sort of uh, equal weight, right? We, it, equal well, weight so, S&P? So we'd be inclined Global. to maybe move a little bit further out than, than T-bills just to have a little bit of duration in, in portfolios. But I think that, you know, to your point about equal weight S&P, right, that's what's lagged. That's what everybody's looking to, to pick up this year. And so not just relying on the Magnificent Seven, I think, is going to be the game plan going forward. David, love it. It's great to catch up. David Leavitt's there of JP Morgan Asset Management getting Lisa frustrated and losing patience. <laughs> Hold on. Hey, you're not alone. No, you're not alone. It's just I tell trying, you. you know, part of the problem is it's also bifurcated. Then you have the other side where suddenly you could get a total fall off in growth. And then it's the opposite. Then it's duration and get out of stock. So it's like one or the other. And this is the reason why people are kind of sitting here in a very uneasy place. Let's get to the long end of the curve. New number for you on the screen. 450 yields up on a session by five basis points on a 30 year. That is a new high for 2024 on a 10 year. Just go through the bond market point by point. Two year out to 30 year. New high of the year on a 30 year, new high of the year on a 10 year, and just a few basis points south of doing exactly the same thing at the front end of the yield curve on a two year yield. That's the latest in the bond market. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here is your Bloomberg Brief with Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. Former President Donald Trump has posted a $175 million bond to put a massive civil fraud verdict on hold while he appeals it. The move preventing New York State from seizing his assets, at least for now. This also halts the collection of the more than $450 million he owes after a judge ruled he lied about his assets to get better loan terms. Trump is still on the hook for the full amount, plus millions in interest, if his appeal fails. McKinsey has made a unique offer to some staff. Take nine months of pay and go away. The management consulting firm is dangling the pay along with career coaching services to some UK staff who they would like to leave. The move is the latest personnel shakeup at the firm and comes shortly after it warned some US consultants they were running out of time to get a promotion. The Iowa Hawkeyes are heading back to the final four after defeating reigning champions the LSU Tigers 94-87. Iowa was led by star guard Caitlin Clark with a game-high 41 points. Tiger star Angel Reese finished with 17 points and a game high 20 rebounds. Iowa now faces now faces UConn on Friday as it seeks to its first NCAA title. That's your Bloomberg Reef, John. It is absolutely awesome. Yara, thank you. Up next on this program, oil hitting a five-month high. Crude oil last September 
was at $95 a barrel. Well, we could see uh, the crude oil market retest that. So this move in energy for us is real. It's definitely real, that conversation up next. Jobs Day, and Bloomberg has the report under surveillance. Job numbers have exceeded expectations consistently. The U.S. is just exceptional. Look around the world. This Friday, Jonathan, Lisa, Anne Marie, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. When you see numbers like this, is that no longer a reason to be hawkish at the Federal Reserve? It's a reason to be cautious, maybe not hawkish. The March Jobs Report, Friday, only on Bloomberg. We've got a lot to talk about on day two of Q2. On the S&P 500, futures lower. On the S&P, negative by 0.4%. In the bond market, up six basis points, 437. New high for the year on a US 10-year, 450 on a 30-year. New high there as well, and a new high in the crude market for 24. 85 on WTI, 84, 95. Under Savannah's this morning, crude oil hitting a five-month high. We don't have a, a lot of levers here. Uh, in the past, we might have utilized the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to perhaps adjust the price of oil. We took the SPR down 350 million barrels a couple of years ago and didn't replace it. We are sort of at the mercy of the vicissitudes of what's going on globally. Uh, crude oil last September was at $95 a barrel. What we could see uh, the crude oil market retest that. So th this move in energy for us is real. It's the latest this morning. Crude oil trading at the highest level since October. Brent briefly topping $89 a barrel and WTI flirting with 85. And Rita Sen of Energy Aspects saying, quote, the bullish setup for the summer remains intact and any pullback is likely to be limited in size. And Rita Sen joins us now for more. And Rita, it's almost like the perfect storm coming together over the last month or so. What kind of levels are you looking for this crude market to test in the next few weeks and months? I mean, if you're, like you said, Brent is at 89, so calling for $90 is hardly a big call right now. But look, you know, we have been saying that we are going to be uh, breaching $90 in the summer. Uh, if anything, that's come a little bit earlier, although we are trading the June uh, contract now, so that is very much the start of the um, summer period. But look, we have seen inventories not build or even draw counter seasonally in Q1. Uh, in certain months, the physical market continues to remain very, very strong. Um, and you're just seeing the finally that being reflected in prices. Prices have lagged what the physical has been telling us for a good three months now. Uh, but now, really, we are starting to see that catch up. We have seen false starts before when it comes to demand picking up in China. How real is that demand story? I actually don't think the China demand story is the driver here. If anything, we are pretty conservative on Chinese demand growth. Um, you know, sub 5% GDP numbers, but also only about half a million barrels per day of year on year demand growth. Um, China is actually more of a stable story. I don't think it's negative, but it's not hugely positive either. Where I think the bigger drivers right now are is on the supply side. We are seeing Mexican production struggling, and uh, Mexico's national oil company Pemex has co come and cut quite a few uh, refiners of production. You've seen the U.S. production drop that happened in January, which was far steeper than most people had expected. That's still struggling to grow. So you have seen quite a few pockets of supply weakness. And having said that, demand overall on a global basis is healthy, but I don't think it's necessarily a China story. If we look at the demand story, though, there's a lot of spare capacity there. I'm looking at Saudi Arabia. I'm looking at the United Arab, Arab Emirates. At what level can you see OPEC Plus led by them actually step in and add more supply to the market. So I think the one thing to keep in mind is that OPEC plus Saudi Arabia, UAE, whoever you really talked about, they are not targeting any specific price levels. For them, the key is going to be to ensure that all the inventories that have built up, let's not forget, we did have a build uh, two years ago with all the US SPR that was released, but we hadn't lost Russian production uh, last year. Yes, the second half we drew, but on balance, the first half we built a fair bit as well. So the overall draw was small. So OPEC plus is looking to draw down the excess inventory to make sure that the market 
market is in balance and only then will they gradually bring back production and again gradually is the key word you're not going to see them come back with all their voluntary cuts back it will be a very slow process if you say this is a supply issue which is interesting because a lot of other people have come on the show and said it's very much a demand issue if it is a supply issue how much can u.s production increase from here to continue to offset any demand or any supply that gets taken off elsewhere so the U.S. production, we actually don't think goes back to 13.3 million barrels per day until July of this year. So it's going to go back up there, but it's going to be a gradual process. Last year, the surge we saw was also driven by a lot of M&A activity. Companies were getting bought, and just before they got bought, they were surging production to increase their valuation. That's kind of coming to a halt. Companies are actually needing to build uh, quite a bit of um, inventory, like uh, uh, well inventory. So that's what they're doing right now. Uh, so production growth is going to be slowing down this year. Um, and then against that, demand is good. It's about 1.4, 1.5 million barrels per day of growth. Um, and that's why I think the fact that you've seen supplies not grow as much as what we've seen last year has caused these imbalances in the market. And Rita, these oil prices spell higher gasoline prices in the United States. Do you think the U.S. will draw on the SPR and how much do you think they will draw on the SPR? I absolutely do think the U.S. Uh, SPR releases on the cards this summer. Let's not forget that it's an election year. Um, the U.S. has been refilling at about 3 million barrels per month. That has been continuing. But now with WTI prices where they are and Mars prices above uh, $79, I think that's going to stop. The refilling is going to stop. Uh, but I do think uh, about, say, 30 million barrels, which is, tends to be the volume that gets announced for emergency releases, can absolutely be used in the summer should oil prices go up. Now, oil prices are not the same as gasoline prices, and releasing crude oil inventories will do very little yep. to alleviate $4 gasoline prices, but this is politics. Amrita, you used a couple of words. Politics is one. Another one is emergency. Can you talk to me about how we define emergency? What the purpose of the SPR was and is, and when it became a political tool going into elections? So... I think historically, the SPR was very much designed for and used only for pure supply disruptions. 2011 Libya, um, and you know, and then subsequently, like whenever you've actually had a supply outage, Russia, there was an expectation that we were going to lose Russian supplies, but the sanctions in reality were never really designed to make Russian um, oil off or take it off the market. So that's why it was a bit of of an incongruity when you saw SPR being released, but the sanctions were actually not designed to take the Russian oil off. But that's when it started to turn, and we actually do sense. And I was in DC just a couple of weeks ago, the sense I absolutely have from them is that now the SPR more widely is used as an energy policy tool. It's no longer just for supply management or supply loss management. Interesting. Amrita, thank you for weighing in. Amrita Sen there of thank energy you. aspects. Now, do they have space for this? Arguably looking at the supply dynamics in America right now, a 13 million barrels a day, record production not just in America but worldwide. You can make the argument they have space for this, but ultimately this is a shift, Bramo. It's a big shift from what this tool used to be and what it's used for now. And how long it can continue if they don't replenish it, right? I mean, that's been one of the issues. How much uh, firepower do they have? My question really goes down to, let's say Saudi Arabia doesn't bring more of their barrels back online heading into the election. What this leaves this administration with in terms of tools to offset that? I mean, has it become basically a policy war between the different kind of oil centers warring up against each other for political aim? Is that what we're looking at? Well, Amos, Hochstein, Jake Sullivan are going to be sitting down with Mohammed bin Salman on Thursday. And I think what they can put to him is we can tap the SPR again, which we know the Saudis didn't really like, or you could potentially start to use some of your spare capacity. They're putting out, what, just a little bit under 9 million barrels a day? They can go to 12. They have that spare capacity. They could cushion the market. Do they want to? WTI, 84.95 Brent crude, just in and around 89, 88.61. Coming up next on this program, Lorena Yurici of T. Rowe Price on a busy week of Fed speak and U.S. payrolls data due on Friday. That conversation is just around a corner. Crude breaking out in the last 24 hours. Bond yields breaking out as well. A 10-year yield of 4.37, a 30-year through 4.50. From New York, this is Bloomberg.
Equities on the S&P 500 negative by 0.4%. If you woke up and maybe you are just waking up and you're looking at this equity market board and you're thinking, eh, all right, not much going on here. Nasdaq's down a half of 1%. Russell, a small caps down 0.7%. If you want to know what's happening, it's happening elsewhere, it's happening in the bond market. It's pretty impressive how well so far, and I stress so far because I can't predict the future, but how well so far this equity market has stood up to developments in the bond market. A double-digit move yesterday, yields up. A move this morning, mid-single digits, six basis points, yields up. 437, new high for the year on a 10-year, on a 30-year. 451, Lisa, new high for the year on a 30-year. Well, and it's the why, and that's what everyone said when they come on the show. Well, you know, yeah, higher bond yields aren't great, but they're right for the they're higher for the right reasons. Basically, because demand is more robust and growth is strong, and that should be good for stocks. This is the sort of rub. People say that there should be a broadening out in the market, and that's what we had been seeing. Today we see the opposite. Equal weighted is underperforming. We see Russell 2000 underperforming. So how consistent can you see the story of a broadening out and some of the smaller companies truly rallying on the heels of higher bond yields? The one broadening out that might continue based on what we're seeing in the next board, and you can go to commodities, energy equities in March up by something like 10%, encouraged by this move in crude again, 89 on Brent, 85 on WTI, and plenty of reasons, I think, for a lot of people. Lisa, to be bullish crude at the moment. From the demand side, because people say that, you know, potentially even China could be coming back online. And then also, as we were hearing from Marita earlier, from a supply side, this idea of potentially curtailed supply, whether it's Mexico or whether it's in the Middle East. And this is really kind of going to the heart of, is this going to be disinflationary or inflationary at a time where demand is still strong? The geopolitics in the mix as well. Under Savannah's this morning, top story for you. Iran is blaming Israel for a deadly airstrike on its embassy in Syria. The strike in Damascus late Monday, killing at least seven Iranian personnel, including senior military commanders. Israel has yet to confirm the attack. Meanwhile, U.S. and Israeli officials are agreeing to continue talks ahead of an expected Israeli operation into the Gaza city of Rafa. Amory, that event yesterday, really, really important for what's developing in commodities. Absolutely. Heightened tension in the Middle East. And this is truly heightened tension, given the fact that this airstrike is the biggest in terms of assassination of this Iranian Revolutionary Guard leader since Qasem Soleimani. And now everyone looks to then what's next? We know Iran will have to respond. How do they respond? They usually go through proxies. Does this mean uh, Lebanese Hezbollah to the more north, more Houthi attacks, potentially moving into the Indian Ocean? We don't know yet, but we do know that they said revenge is coming. The risk going back to October, at least at a prospect of a regional conflict. And it's honestly simmering, and we've heard that earlier from some of our guests. Basically, it's going to escalate on some level. The question is when markets kind of are percolating, waking up to it, is that kind of what we're seeing right now? This is really hard to get your hands around. The more interesting question right now to me is, has the U.S. kind of lost its clutch over Israel and Israel kind of going it alone? And is that really the main risk, not Iran, but Israel going after Hezbollah in the north? We heard that, I think, from Stephen Kirk of the Council of Foreign Relations, and he certainly alluded to that, that maybe we overestimate the influence the United States has on Israel and the leader Netanyahu. That was kind of what he was alluding to. He also spoke about how Iran doesn't want a disruption to its main source of income. It doesn't want a disruption to the oil market. Israel has a goal. It is to root out Hamas and to root out some of the Iranian proxies that have made it unlivable in certain areas of the country. So that has become really the dueling goals that are not really working together too well. Clear and obvious escalation in the Middle East. These aren't major moves in the commodity market, but you're just starting to see that breakout continue. Brent crude, 88.59, 84.95 on WT. Our next story, President Biden will visit Baltimore on Friday to survey the collapsed Francis Scott Key Bridge. Currently only a small shipping channel is open since the disaster at the port of Baltimore last week. The Washington Post reporting the companies which own and operate the container ship Dali have asked a federal judge to excuse them from any liability or cap damages at $43 million. AMH, big question last week, where's the liability? Where's the liability and who's responsible? Where does the money come from? We heard from the Treasury Secretary. We heard from President Biden that the, there is going to obviously be some liability when it comes to the company and their insurance providers. But the president said he wants to get federal money there as soon as possible. So some federal money did go there immediately. But we heard from Karine Jean-Pierre yesterday, and she pretty much insinuated there is going to be a bit of a fight when it comes to this in Congress. Is Congress, which you have many on the right saying they need more fiscal discipline, going to want to spend billions of dollars to a blue state of Maryland. And she said yesterday, it's a complicated scenario. 
We're going to have to have those conversations. Money and time. Money, lots of it. Time, who knows? Weeks, months, years. It's certainly not going to be weeks to sort this mess out, is it? This is my shocked face for the fact that things aren't going to move quickly in Washington, yep. D.C. I mean, essentially. But at a certain point, you have to wonder, OK, well, then what gets clogged up in the meantime for the region? Let's look ahead. Hot of the expected factory data weighing on markets, pushing back rate cut bets. The ISM manufacturing gauge showing expansion for the first time in 16 months. Investors looking ahead to a slew of employment data this week, including jolts, ADP, jobless claims and U.S. payrolls on Friday. Blarina Yurici of T. Rowe Price saying this. The payroll data this week are likely to show the economy continued to add jobs at a healthy pace, but that the January strength was likely distorted. We will need to watch the jolts report closely once again for all its flaws. Blarina joins us now for more. Now, Blarina, can we talk about the D word that you use for January? Likely distorted. What did you mean by that? Well, I, when you look at the inflation data and the labor market data, there was a pop in January that was not corroborated with what we've seen in February and what we've seen with a trend in the economy more broadly. Perhaps that weakness in inflation we saw in the second half of last year was uh, exaggerated also, and it was more pronounced than the underlying strength of the economy probably allows. But also, I would say that January looked too strong, and the economy, both on the labor market side and inflation, is going to moderate in the coming months. Now, the big question is how much and how much space is that going to allow the Fed to cut interest rates this year? You said to look ahead to the data and the JOLTS report, and I think you referred to the JOLTS report as flawed. Can we talk about the flaws in the JOLTS report? It's interesting because I know you're not alone. A lot of people would agree with you. There are flaws to the JOLTS report, the reporting, the way they gather the information. But Chairman Powell himself looked to JOLTS, job openings, quits, as evidence that maybe their policy stance was having an effect on the labour market. Is that why it's important to you later this morning? Well, we are all paying attention to it because it was an early indicator of the extent of the tightness of the labor market, that spike in the vacancy rate, the uh, increase in quiz. They all told us that the balance between uh, supply and demand in the labor market was really off. But we know the issues that some of them, which you mentioned, response rates, sample size, uh, some job posting being online, but not really being serious job postings. So. We we have to look at a range of data, but there are some uh, aspects of the JOLTS report, such as the quits rate, which I think are very timely. And they've been correlating very well with wage inflation lately. So I would look at this. And, and there is a bigger question here that uh, we're discussing since the CBO report uh, in February, which alluded to about a 3 million positive sup labor supply shock to the economy in 2023. And that question is, what is the run rate or the break-even rate of payroll growth for the U.S. economy this year? Should it be around 100K, as we had been expected before? And that 100K employment growth means that the unemployment rate can stay more or less flat, or is it higher? So in that case, if it is higher, uh, strong employment growth does not necessarily need to be inflationary and the unemployment rate will not decline further. So for this, that's what I uh, alluded to in that note. For this, we need to look at what happens with vacancy rates in the coming months and what happens to the quits rates. Because if those increase again, then this report is telling us a different story. It's telling us that the labor market is becoming unbalanced again. Lorena, how concerned are you that people are too quick to dismiss good data as an aberration? Well, it, it's a fair question. Uh, we have tended over the last two years to be uh, a little bit too optimistic about the U.S. economy not taking into account just how strong the U.S. consumer was and how that was going to pull the economy forward. We got some fiscal tailwinds as well. Now, the question about January is not so much about dismissing good data, but taking it with a pinch of salt and saying the economy is in a solid footing, but is it overheating right now when interest rates are as high as about 5% or not? Well, Lorena, this is the reason why I find oil prices so interesting today. And it's not just oil, but it's commodities more generally. If we are looking at messy data when it comes to some of the incoming economic uh, figures, 
Can't we just look at the commodity space and say that this is evidence of just how much demand there is out there at a time where you're seeing growth come back, not only in the U.S., but also in places like China? So that's a fair question. And the thing with commodities is that there are so many factors that drive it. It can be geopolitics. It can be uh, shocks to supply and it can be demand. So basically putting uh, the relevant weight on those factors matters a lot when you're going to use commodity prices as a signal for what is happening with a broader economy. But another thing we know about this business cycle is that the U.S. economy has really under, uh, overperformed rather uh, the rest of the world and in emerging markets. So this pickup in commodity prices could well be signaling that those economies that had been underperforming the U.S. are coming back online. But I don't think it's telling us something new about the U.S. economy. Before you go, can you help us translate the Fed speak ahead of time? Can I just go through the calendar? Bauman, Williams, Mester, Daly, Bauman, Goresby, Powell, Barr, Kugler, Harker, Barkin, Goresby, Mester. I mean, Blarina, how is any of that helpful? I don't know, but that's the schedule. Can you tell me what you're looking for this week? How much time do we have? Uh, it's a really, really packed calendar this week, both with data and with uh, Fed speak. I would say uh, I'm looking for how is the... Um, committee consensus evolving. We know that they want to signal they have a cutting bias. Uh, the data is getting in the way of the Fed cutting, uh, perhaps by as much as they want. They've signaled in March uh, three cuts for this year, and it feels like that's basically the ceiling for the market. And any positive surprises to the data run the risk of First of all, pushing the first cut to July and also pushing that number from three cuts to two. So how is the consensus evolving? How are the hogs dealing with this? I'm, I'm interested to know who those two daughters are. And also, uh, if I'm not mistaken, we have Powell this week. And so yeah. uh, I, I would say uh, he was fairly dovish during the press conference slightly less dovish in this interview on Friday. Uh, and so uh, I want to hear from him today what is his personal view. He's going to speak specifically to the economic outlook and what are the milestones that's in the data. Because he'll, he'll say they are data dependent. They will stick to the strategy. But what data are we looking at and what are the ranges uh, that will guide them towards uh, a cut? Because they've also said we're not too sensitive to good news on the labor market and growth so long as inflation continues uh, to slow. So is he going to stick to that? It's a good point. Blarina, we've got to leave it there. Blarina, you reach you there of T. Rowe Price. As I was reading all those Fed speakers, I scrolled down, there was another seven well, going I into Friday. I have a lot Literally of questions. Literally another seven scheduled speeches. I actually am looking forward to it. These are the questions that I would like answered. Please, go ahead. I want to speak ahead. directly to list? people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who eats lunch together? <laughs> How happy they are with Powell? Whether they get together frequently? what they're looking to communicate, what data they're looking for, and then, you know, most importantly, what they think of, you know, bonds. Is this Fed speak or Mean Girls? <laughs> no. you know, it's the high school or the FMC? <laughs> no, what is this? <laughs> no, I want to understand. Who has lunch, what they think I mean, of the headmaster? Yeah. You can't sit with us. That's the vibes you're giving right. off today, Lisa. Look, they, they're all going to say, you know, look, we, we all get along, et cetera. But there have to be camps that are starting to get formed. Sure. You know, there's a consensus that's kind of fraying around the edges, and we saw that in the dots. And I'm curious I know about within that. that is a serious question. I know that. I just want to pick up on what's happening <laughs> in the equity market. That slide's picking up. We talked about it being contained in yesterday's session maybe being contained just a little bit this morning as well. We're down about 0.6% on the S&P, starting to sort of catch up with what's happening in bonds, Lisa, and what's happening in commodities this morning. It challenges the valuation proposition at a time where some people are getting a little queasy about the idea that this sort of incredible rally, the biggest two-quarter rally that we've seen going back more than a decade, how much it can really kind of keep surviving on momentum alone, John. I liked what Blarina said, though, about what's more important with Chairman Powell, reflecting the consensus of the committee in the news conference of the Federal Reserve and maybe just getting a little bit more of his own opinion across in the next couple of days. It's, it's worth looking for. Yeah, how much of the dovish tilt is him versus trying to reflect the committee? Precisely. Put it better than I did. Let's give an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here is your Bloomberg Brief with Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. Boeing's bumpy year is being felt by pilots at United Airlines. 
The carrier has asked pilots to take unpaid time off next month as it grapples with delayed deliveries of new Boeing planes. With fewer planes, that's reduced the number of flying hours United had planned for its pilots this year. And the additional time off could reduce excess staffing. The move could extend into the summer and potentially the fall. UBS says it plans to buy back up to $2 billion of its shares, with up to $1 billion of that total expected to take place this year. The Swiss bank confirming the share repurchase plan today after having suspended its previous plan a year ago amid its takeover of former rival Credit Suisse. The bank said it expects to complete that merger by the end of the second quarter. Rubrik, a cloud and data security startup backed by Microsoft, has filed for an IPO. This adding to the roster of companies planning to go public after successful trading debuts by Reddit and Astera Labs. The size and price of Rubrik's planned share will be disclosed in a later filing. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. Just an update on what's happening with Rivian. They just came out with first quarter vehicles. The numbers, they delivered 13,588 against an estimate of 11,893. So that's an upside surprise. The stock is firmer in the pre-market. Still waiting for numbers from the big one from Tesla. Up next on the program, lowering expectations for Tesla. All EV makers have had to lower their prices a lot in order to maintain demand we've seen a game of market share moving back and forth between byd and tesla i think tesla is more or less finding a floor in uh, uh, in china we'll catch up with bloomberg's ed ludlow up next on the program live from new york city this morning good morning Forty-two minutes away from the opening bound in New York City, day two of Q2, and it's shaping up as follows. This equity market starting to wake up to what's developing elsewhere. The S&P 500 down by 0.6, the Nasdaq down by 0.8. We're down one full percentage point now on the Russell, the small caps lower. Here's the elsewhere. Switch up the board and get to the bond market. The two-year yield very, very close to the highs of the year. The highs of the year 474.89, right now 472.84 on a 10-year double-digit move yesterday. Up another nine basis points now this morning. There's your new high for the year, very close to 440. And Lisa, a clean break of 450 on a U.S. 30 year. It's the why that I find interesting. Yesterday we got the ISM manufacturing data and the prices paid that came in higher than expected. Today, is it oil? Is it just this idea that maybe people are not as sanguine with this idea that the Fed can kind of uh, truly cut rates in a significant way? The why might be more important right now. It might be on the next board. Let's talk about the why. Brent crude, very close to 89, breaching that level early this morning. 88.45, up by a little more than 1%. WTI up by about 1.3% to 84.80. At least the tension in the Middle East, a big part of that story too. So this is really the interesting part of the people who we've talked to this morning. There are people saying it's a supply story, including Amrita Sen. And then there are plenty of people saying this is a demand story, including Kathy Jones, saying it is because this economy is so robust, it matters because it sort of depends on how persistent it will be and whether it could be potentially more inflationary or less. Put it all together, add it all up. That's the recipe for stocks moving south. We're down by 0.6% on the S&P 500. Under surveillance this morning, lowering expectations for Tesla. All EV makers have had to lower their prices a lot in order to maintain demand. We've seen a game of market share moving back and forth between BYD and Tesla. I think Tesla is more or less finding a floor in, uh, uh, in China and in a place where they can maintain the kind of volumes they've been setting in the country um, in, uh, in recent months. Here's the latest this morning. Analysts cutting estimates for Tesla vehicle sales as the EV maker faces slowing demand and higher rate pressures. A Bloomberg survey saying analysts expect first quarter deliveries of about 449,000 vehicles. That would be down 7% from a record fourth quarter. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow joins us around the table for more. Ed, this number could drop in the next 60 minutes or so. Right. Are we going to see a Tesla problem or an EV problem? Both. You know, Tesla has a clear strategy, right, which was heavy discounts towards the end of the quarter in all markets. And they telegraphed it. They said, come April 1st, we are going to raise prices, which is interesting in the context of China, because everyone else in China did the opposite, continued to cut deeper with more incentives. And Tesla stuck to their guns. I mean, Pierre talked about finding a flaw based on the actions they, they took this week. They found it, you know, and, and particularly in the, in the, the kind of 40,000 US dollar range. Um, that's the problem 
you know, with the market, it's pricing, the sensitivity is well discussed. The Tesla problem is they only make four cars. And what we learned in the quarter gone, particularly in North America of combustion engine cars, is consumers love choice. They love a really cheap sedan. They love the, the sort of cheap SUV that has a gas engine right now. And the Model 3, Model Y in particular, which is 90% of Tesla sales, it's not really resonating anymore. Is anyone actually buying Teslas outright? Or is everybody leasing and sort of are they depending completely on financing a, from someone else? Fantastic question. The impact of rates is there to see. Elon Musk has even talked about the impact of rates. You know, it's one of the bingo card items in earnings calls, whether he'll talk about the Fed and rates. In this country, it's particularly important on financing. At the end of last quarter, in fact, last week, I leased a Model Y because the leasing cost was so low. $300 a month. But if I were to have financed that vehicle from a sheer cash flow perspective, you're talking six dollars to $700 a month because of the high impact of, of rate penalties. What would the argument, though, have been for you to buy it outright? What would the advantage have been? I'm serious. I'm asking because for, I'm wondering. For my personal anyway. economics, it wasn't an option. But I think the answer is uh, that you, you think that the Model Y will retain its value three years from now, or you think that uh, test the strategy to keep the Model Y relevant is software updates. My kind of thinking was, well, it'll probably be obsolete in three years time, so what's the point? You might want to change your EV with a greater range or more complex software, whatever it might be. And I want to ask you about China, because yeah. last year, when you see the uptick of Chinese individuals going out buying tar cars, yes. quarter percentage, a quarter of those cars were all going to EVs, not hybrids, EVs. If Tesla's not competitive in China, can they be a global EV leader? Well, Tesla's going through in China what kind of Mercedes went through. It has a brand identity. It is a Western automaker where there is a status uh, implication of buying a Tesla. The, the difference in that market, as you point out, is it's much more mature. There's higher penetration of EV sales. But there are many more domestic players offering a wider range of price points. Xiaomi is the, is the story of this week, right, where they're coming out with a $30,000 EV. Whether it materializes or not, we'll see. And at the other end, you do have the luxury players, Mercedes, with their battery electric equivalents. The problem Tesla's is having is finding where it sits there. You know, Pierre was, Ferragut was talking about the floor and pricing, but there's also the, the design and, and, and spec of a Model Y or a Model 3. Where does it sit within the landscape? And right now, it's kind of that mid-nothingness of the market where it's not a luxury car, nor is it a budget option either. They almost look like each other. Do, would you say that the Xiaomi is almost a Tesla Model 3? Oh, let me get into Ed Ludlow, the car critic, but the curvature, the design. I mean, the, the, the criticism that people have with Model Y is it's just a chubby Model 3. It's not actually an SUV. And that in the North American market is absolutely key. It's why Rivian at first had a lot of success because 75% of American purchases in the last decade have been light truck category, big bulky SUVs. Since moving to America, you, you see it on the streets, right? That's what I've lived. The, SU, the Model Y is not that. And again, it goes back to what we just discussed a moment ago. Where did the existing lineup for Tesla sit in all of these different markets? Uh, they're very similar to everything else that's out there right now. I have one question, and it's sure. sort of dominated for me, I think, this industry for the last couple of years. I've been pretty consistent on this. If demand is so great, if these vehicles are so good, why is there a price war? Well, that's the thing is I don't know that the demand is so great. You know, we, it's important to state the basics. We still have growth in EV I'm sales. I'm talking specifically to China. Yeah, it's a price war in a market that everyone heralds as the market for EVs. It's great, everyone wants them. Why is there a price war there? Policy, because the Chinese government were much quicker than the US to put policy support in place in the first place, but then take it away. You forget that actually there hasn't been government-led incentives in China for about a couple of years, which means it comes out the pocket of the automakers themselves. Um, you have to get the balance right. You unlock addressable market by cutting prices. You lose on the bottom line, and then that market runs out. You know, there are only so many people buying at 40 grand, even in China. Yep. This is precisely, Lisa, what we're trying to get at. There isn't a viable market without the policy support anywhere. There isn't one in China, there's not one in Europe, there's not one in the United States either. You need the policy support for this to grow. And the reason for the policy support is different depending on the region. In China, it might be to be more independent from some of the fossil fuels that they import. For the US, it might be for green ambitions, but it's different and there are different price uh, kind of underpinnings as well for both regions. And this was great, just fantastic. Looking forward to Bloomberg Technology a little bit later on today with Ed Ludlow and Caroline Hyde. Looking forward to tomorrow because we're gonna have a lot to talk about. Mark Capital of Allspring, Jules Moek of AXA, Michael Collins of PGM, and former House Majority Leader Eric Cantor 
Atlanta as well. Your equity market's breaking down just a touch. The S&P session lows, negative 0.7%. In the bond market, yields very close to session highs and new highs for 2024. Your cash open, 34 minutes away. This was Bloomberg Surveillance.